everybody, and welcome back to the first uh, 372 pages book of 2023. The future. We are finally in the future, Mike. Welcome never back thought. to the first. <laughs> Is that what you said? Back to the first? Sure. Uh, you said, welcome back to the first episode. Uh, the first episode of 2023. Okay. Welcome back I to thought, the first. I thought you said I'd... the first episode of the book. Of the first. It's not even this. We, we recorded one of these a uh, couple weeks ago. But Look, I was just—I'm tr- I'm trying to be one of those people who's hypercritical of everything. That sounds good. Yeah, this is the revenge for our pronunciation <laughs> thing the other night. Uh, yes. Tricks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I was just so caught up in the in the thrill of living in the future. You know, the, the, it's new, true. New dates to write on your checks because this book that we're currently reading, Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett P. Service, is just full of futuristic ideas and uh, concepts and space cars and such things that but it's all the future of the past so it's quite entertaining uh yeah even i was shocked that even back then um you know remember popular mechanics Mm -hmm. just kept insisting that we would all fly to work or play in our personal helicopter sure (laughs) and uh this thing is just loaded with personal helicopter no it it has things like that though so it'll be fun to see all the many many predictions and how they uh came true or not yes and one prediction that i could not have made uh would be that when we picked this book out is that we would uh, the podcast and our many loyal listeners would become uh quite possibly the biggest patrons of a a occult um i could not have predicted that are you you prepared to label it a cult (laughs) well you know it's a I'm not pr- allegedly. It could allegedly be a cult. There is a when, when if you buy the copy of the book that we linked to, it was the you know the first result for it on Amazon. You can obviously read this for free on the Gutenberg Project or wherever. But if you buy the 4.99 paperback, um, it says any profits generated from the sale of this book will go toward the Free River Community Project, a project designed to promote harmonious community living and well-being in the world. To learn more about the Free River Project, please visit, visit freerivercommunity.com. Yeah, so, that all, so far, so good. So far, so good. Uh, and if you go to that website, which, of course, we, we both did and did some deep dives into the things behind it, it seems like a, a fairly good-natured deal. It's a just a, a guy who, who wants to do that. He's, a I think, a young British guy who uh, hopes to give the hippie dream tangibility. He's very much, it says, imagine Woodstock, but a bit more organized, smaller, and long-term, and you're probably halfway there to imagining what he wants to do with this free river community project. Yeah. And he's, uh, he looks the part. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no question. He, he, uh, he's chosen his lane and he stays in it. He plays the, the, uh, sitar Mm -hmm. plays the, are they singing bowls? Is is that the, Oh, sure. Yes. He gives you a lesson on that. You can go to YouTube and watch him. uh, What Stu Hampton, I believe is his name. He probably has uh, those, uh, the I think, devil sticks that you see people doing in the parking lot outside of a string cheese incident oh, concert. Where you... For sure. And that uh, the giant, uh, what is the giant yo-yo thing that you throw in the oh, air? Oh, yep, yep, spin yep. Spin around. <laughs> for sure he does that. And if you want to hack in with him, of course, you can of find course. him yes. uh, anywhere at a local park or whatever. So, yeah, it all seems very good-natured, and I'm not sure exactly what's happening. I don't know if there's a tract of land he has his eye on to establish his community or if it's really just more of a general uh, good vibes kind of kind of thing maybe it's in the metaverse who knows but uh i think that you know a, a sizable chunk of money from a, a 4.99 amazon book is probably getting funneled to this to this project and <laughs> in terms of we've always wondered what these books are doing like who is profiting off of these uh printed amanda mckittrick ross books or lair of the white worm sure and, you know, we just assumed it was some, you know, enterprising, opportunistic weirdo who was doing that. But it's it's kind of fun to see it uh, supporting an actual cause. And uh, it, it's better than this guy running, you know, a, a NFT scheme or something like that. Or, um, you know, any other type of unsavory ways you'd raise money for your commune slash cult slash whatever. Yeah. And, and um Stu Stu Hampton, he does link. I'm looking at his page right now. It's StuHampton dot com. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Stu spelled not like the the meat uh, soup, but uh, S T U. <laughs> he is a visual artist, and 
Of some note, I guess, because, uh, but here's his uh, little bio. I'm inspired by the psychedelic hippie peace and love movement and have spent many years creating through paintings, etc. I also have a strong interest in exploring consciousness through meditation, plant medicines, sound healing, and connecting with the transcendental. All right. So, but one of the things that he did, he did uh, art for the Dr. John. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The yep. uh, pro bono podiatrist, Dr. John. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm going to come down to the Free River Community Project, Stu. We're going to do some of that sitar music. Yeah, oh, that good juju. Hand over some of that plant medicine. Oh, yeah, Dr. <laughs> John, would like some of that plant medicine. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we absolutely have to, uh, he seems like he's quite available. I think we have to reach out and possibly talk to him about uh, how we came up with this idea that this was going to be how he raises money for the project and that uh, if he has any other books out there or just, uh, you know, how, how is it going in terms of the Free River community? I think if he's willing to talk, that would be a fun little extra. And I would love it. I, it would be my favorite thing ever if he was just a giant fan of Garrett P. Service and just like brought us to service school. Like, how long you guys got? Yes. Yeah, right. Sitar music drifting in through the background. Like, right. Hey, shut that up. I'm talking Garrett P. Service here. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's in many ways is like the leader. There's a, a, a golden idol of him at the heart of the Free River Project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've got to do that. But uh, speaking of Garrett P service it it brought me no um end of delights that when we announced this book on patreon uh one of the first comments that was posted was from john freeman who said order your copy before it sells out service is selling and uh, <laughs> it, it sort of makes yes. it makes it makes all this worthwhile that uh that 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 video is not extremely popular but the fact that it is it resonates that that was someone's first instinct when they heard this because it wasn't even mine is uh, a job well done i think for all of us oh yes i i golf clap for that one <laughs> uh and the, the fact that that video is not well known <laughs> like even if we've tried yes, we've, we've, we've done our tried best. to drag people to it <laughs> oh well it's, it's not taken if i do not uh compose my own parody of that by the end of this book something will have gone horribly wrong i think right <laughs> Uh, well, let's dig into it because, yeah, so this is Edison's Conquest of Mars by Garrett P. Service. It's the uh, potentially unauthorized follow-up to War of the Worlds that was released serially in a Boston newspaper about a, a year after War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And it's, uh, as we discussed in the opening episode, a uh, entry in the burgeoning in the eight, late 1800s genre of Edison Aid, which is just a Thomas Edison fanfic where he... Uh, invents stuff and saves the world and, and I guess in several of the books goes to the moon. Yes, and, and I have to confess right away, uh, I corrected it so I, I know that this is true now, but when I first started reading, I had forgotten <laughs> that it was a sequel to. <laughs> and so I was like, you know, as a grade school teacher circling it like, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds interesting and yet it gets... She gets barely a mention here. Yeah, he sort of does yada yada over the a lot of destruction of major major Earth cities in this first uh, first couple paragraphs. It is. Uh, it begins. In fact, if you don't mind, I'm going to. It's a l slightly longish sure. sentence, but Let's it, it gives you the sense of what you have to to deal with. It is impossible that the stupendous events which followed the disastrous invasion of the Earth by the Martians should go without record, and circumstances having placed the facts at my disposal, I deem it a duty, both to posterity and to those who were witnesses of and participates in the avenging <laughs> counterstroke, that the Earth dealt back at its ruthless enemy in the heavens to write down the story in a connected form. <laughs> I feel like that's like the harumphing British way of saying... Do you remember when our parents died? <laughs> yes, very much. Yeah, man. Uh, New York was leveled. Uh, we're still dealing with the after effects of that to this day. Well, I feel like I should jot down a few notes about that. Like, no, we're all still living it, man. We're... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. A, it's a very 1800s thing to sort of uh, justify why you had to tell someone a story, like in fiction. You're yes. like, well, well, I will jot down these ideas that I had. I, uh, if it do behoove you to uh, understand my ramblings, I shall do this. Like, just tell the story. We're, we we yes, picked the yeah. book up to read it. 
Your poor narrator was involved in some small measure in these matters in which the earth was collapsed into a smoking hulk of ruin. And uh, so, I, if you might allow me, I might take a few moments of your time and write down a few things about it. And everyone reading is like, yep, this is, uh, he, oh, yes. he's fallen back on this. This is like our once upon a time. Yeah. But yeah, so it's a very it is very 1800s in this in this sense, not just the it's because it's set pretty much contemporarily like he's writing this as if it's, you know, happening in the paper today, you know. Um, yeah. So it, the, the, the style is, is definitely old timey. And the uh, terminology is funny, too, because he gets a lot of credit, I guess, from people for coming up with some concepts. But they were still very much working out a lot of sci fi stuff like he's talking about the Martians fleeing earth in their projectile cars yeah <laughs> so they're still working out a lot of sci-fi terms and he is absolutely uncertain what to call a spaceship throughout the course of this book he <laughs> he fluctuates between like four different things projectile cars is the first one about which he says the force of the explosion may be imagined when it is recollected that they had to give the car a velocity of blah 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 like maybe a oh hell yeah I'm imagining it now man <laughs> yeah and what was the fastest anything was even traveling it says seven miles per second in order to overcome the attraction of the Earth but right. oh, was a Model T going like what seven miles an hour like it's uh I guess he's expecting his readers to extrapolate let me just jot down that number here yes. and it's, oh wow that's like a really fast horse. <laughs> And it says they possessed a mysterious explosive of unimaginable, unimaginable puissance. Yes. So, I mean, that's that's asking a lot because I can imagine some serious puissance. I don't know. <laughs> this is, I mean, but he, this is another tick of, of this type of author where he just describes things as uh, unimaginable or undescribable type of thing uh, as he's as he's telling us a story. So. Um, oh, he does. He that is very much a tick of his. Some of them are very funny. I find. <laughs> yes, it's great. Uh, but so the he talks about this explosion and the, the thousands of victims is one of the little heads. Uh, there's little subheaders. Yeah. Uh, the terrible results achieved by the invaders had produced everywhere a mingled feeling of consternation and hopelessness. <laughs> Consarn it! Yeah. I'm. I'm a bit concerned at these chaps. This, you know what? This chaps my hide. I, I don't like this. Yes. I was feeling a lot of consternation on September 11th when I woke up that day in college. I was very concerned. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I guess that, you know, the word must have, you know, packed a lot of force back then. It just doesn't uh, translate. Yeah, it's hilarious, yeah, because it follows that with the devastation was widespread. So, <laughs> so the, yeah, those are the events of the, uh, of the, of the War of the Worlds, I guess, that he's still talking about. Yes. And then he, he sort of then moves on to his own book. Yeah. yeah. I, what do you call those little subheadings? It's just sub chapter headings. Yeah. They, they t do. They slow down a little bit or do they keep going? I mean, they, kind of they keep coming and they often have fairly funny, uh, funny, unintended, funny effects because it says like uh, despondency black as night brooded over some of the fairest portions of the globe. And then the subheading <laughs> all all not yet destroyed. Yet all not yet all had not been destroyed. So it's like a a narrator butting in to like you know interrupt the guy's story. Uh, but here's here's a description of of what uh, what they left behind. The awful agencies had ex extirpated. Sorry, I don't use that word much. Yeah, this is a tricky one, man. To pastures and meadows and dried up the very springs of fertility in the earth where they had touched it. In some parts of the devastated lands, pestilence broke out. Elsewhere, there was famine, despondency, black as night, brooded over some of the fairest portions of the globe. But mostly consternation. <laughs> yeah, he leads up. That's the, uh, that's the uh, lead up to, yet all had not been destroyed. It's like, well, <laughs> a little bit of whiplash here. <laughs> and that happens again in the next paragraph. He says, uh, he says that uh, from those lands which had fortunately escaped invasion, relief was sent to the sufferers. The outburst of pity and charity exceeded anything the world had known. Differences of race and religion were swallowed up in the universal sympathy which was felt for those who had suffered so terribly. So this really is science fiction at this point in time. Yes. <laughs> uh, from an evil that was as unexpected as it was unimaginable in its enormity. But the worst was not yet. Uh, will you settle down? <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> Uh, so the, they're looking at Mars through, I guess, the only 
telescope that isn't charred and you know with a skeleton yeah you know Pestil- welded to it by, <laughs> yeah <laughs> by skeleton heat. looking through it as pestilence is you know uh, enveloping the uh, other half of the telescope and uh so i just want to point out we're still uh, as far as i can tell on page one <laughs> The faint-hearted ended the suspense with self-destruction. The stout-hearted remained steadfast, but without hope and knowing not what to do. <laughs> Mass suicide on page one, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus. <laughs> Service, dial it back. Yeah. Because yeah, they've gotten news. The reason everyone is feeling so bad, even the stout-hearted, it says, amid the stir of renewed life came the fatal news that Mars was undoubtedly preparing to deal us a death blow. <laughs> So I guess that's one of those, you know, sensationalist, you know, yellow journalism papers of the day. That's their uh, 48 point headlight. Mars to deal death blow. (laughs) Can we dial it back just a bit? But didn't they in the original book? I've never read the original I haven't either. book. It's not. I, a, I, I probably haven't seen the movie slept either. through the Tom Cruise movie or uh-huh. something. I don't know. But uh, don't they? They like catch a cold or something, and then so they... yeah. I, I I feel like that was alluded to at some point here that uh, you know pathogens were their downfall. So are they going to? That's why they're just going to come down and just like you know what? Uh, enough with this. I don't want to. I don't want to catch the flu again. So just bomb them. Mm-hmm. We bombed ninety seven percent. Let's just <laughs> take out the remaining three uh, percent. Is that kind of the, what they're thinking they're going to do? I I guess so. And uh, you know, who, I don't know what their motivation was either in terms of why they needed to come down and, and bomb ninety seven percent of the of the Earth. Right. Yeah, we get a little hint of it later, but it seems like speculation. But. Let's let's hold that for later. Nice. Well, he starts introducing some of the other characters. And there, so the narrator, Garrett P. Service, is the narrator and a character in this book. But he starts uh, introducing some of the other players, which, you know, no one really has a role or a personality. Even Edison just sort of like, um, you know, and then Edison did this is the way that the story is pretty mm-hmm. much delivered. But he talks about Lord Kelvin, the great mm-hmm. English savant, uh, Air Röntgen, the discoverer of the famous X-ray, and especially Thomas A. Edison, the American genius of science. And I just had to look it up. The uh, the guy had discovered X-rays three years earlier. So that is a very interesting thing to imagine. The just going to get an X-ray in the 1800s is a uh, it's <laughs> it's hard to imagine since houses probably didn't have electricity or indoor plumbing. Just being like, well, Martha, I must take the mule into town. They're going to X-ray me to see if I've <laughs> truly broken a bone. I'll be back to. Uh, sit by the fire uh, when the lights go out at 5 p.m. Uh, is It's looking at your skeleton. Is it safe, do you think? Oh, oh Lord, no. They, they, it's absolutely not. They, the discovery of the lead shield is still 20 years away. But uh, Because yeah. when we pose for a photograph, we have to stand still for 23 and a half minutes. So oh. for this x-ray, how long could that be? Yes, I'll, I will have to hold my breath throughout the duration of this time. That's actually the leading cause of death. The radiation is... Is, is is faint second to that. So if I if I do not make it home, uh, tell our three year old son he is in charge of the farm. <laughs> of course, he's <laughs> he's already doing half the work. <laughs> uh, but he yeah. So you know he discovers X rays and then is made a superhero three three years later. It's yeah. pretty nice as yeah, well. Really. <laughs> but uh, I hope that this this is you're talking about naming things and he doesn't know. This was the one that the first appearance of it that I hoped that it would stick was uh, wonderful stories quickly found their way into the newspapers concerning what Mr. Edison had already accomplished with the aid of his model electrical balloon. (laughs) That's such a great name for the ships that are going to be described. Yeah. But I think that's only used once, his wonderful electrical balloon. Right, because he talks about a, uh, he calls it a flying machine right before there. So he's already called it I think some did he call it space car, flying machine, and electrical balloon. <laughs> <laughs> electrical balloon is a clear winner there. Because <laughs> then they have a uh, the the copy we're reading is uh, well I don't think the paperback has them, but uh, get on that uh, hippie guy, come on. But uh, the uh, Project Gutenberg does have the illustration, so it cuts right to the illustration that looks absolutely nothing like an electrical balloon. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Clearly, just a underwater vessel that they've uh, you know brought up to the, to fly through the sky. Yeah, that uh, that drawing. If you don't, I highly suggest to check it out on the Gutenberg thing. The uh, the drawings are. <laughs> I guess these were exciting people's imagination as it came out in the. It was serialized, right, in a newspaper. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. So you know, waiting for the next uh, 
you know, elbowing past someone to get to the oxblood chair to drop down into it and look at a picture of this right. electrical balloon. My, my sir, like pour the walnuts, the newest uh, iteration of Edison's Conquest of Mars has come out. Uh, like light a pipe and we'll enjoy this. Well, I, I, I hate to uh, elbow past you, but I, uh, I have dibs on that <laughs> old shoe. <laughs> uh, the he has dis- he has discovered. I think something uh, they describe it as a. Uh, um, uh, a way to overcome the Martians is also invented these uh, electrical balloons at the same time. So he's just at work doing all this sort of stuff. So it's very much, um, you know, fanfic essentially about this inventor, like whatever we need, he's just going to come up with it on the spot essentially. And when you put it in terms of like what this would be like for like a modern person, it's it obviously extremely cringe to be uh, fetishizing this guy this much because if it was, you know, Jeff Bezos, Bezos, whatever, or Elon Musk, it would be a, um, it would be the worst thing you've ever read on the internet. Of then, Kanye West quickly <laughs> whipped up a, right. <laughs> like one month later, um, can I? Nope, sorry, it's already on the printer. Yeah, just imagine any, any meme you've seen where a, a politician is drawn as a, you know, a, uh, a buff hero or something and that is that is pretty much this about thomas edison yes. <laughs> uh so his electrical balloon they decide to do uh uh you know proof of concept by just quickly flying to the moon yeah they just sort of toss off a trip to the moon <laughs> which i found very funny and this uh, here's the tick i alluded to earlier he says um uh, it would carry me into technical details that would hardly interest the reader to describe the mechanism of Mr. Edison's flying machine. Sounds good. I don't need Let to... Let it uh... suffice to say that ah, it depended upon on. the principle of electric attraction and repulsion. <laughs> yeah, don't get into the details because I won't buy any of it anyway. But what he's really saying is, look, you're too stupid to understand this, so I'm not going to. And then he proceeds to do it for like eight pages. It's incredible. It's a very <laughs> lengthy... Uh, display of you know something that if you had any idea what he was talking about you'd be like absolute mumbo jumbo does not work that way they probably even knew that in the 1800s but (laughs) he even includes that this he's talking about like how the sun he uses the gravitron of the sun to like reverse polarity that this energy which the sun exercises against its own gravitation is electrical in its nature hardly anybody will doubt It's like, well, I don't know, man. I think people still had some pretty weird ideas in 1898 about how uh, science was working, you know, drilling a hole in your skull to relieve your bad humors type of thing. It's like, I I think there probably would have been a bit of doubt here. (laughs) It is this whole, all these descriptions that he does after saying he won't describe it to you because you're too dumb. uh, Remind me of people, have you ever met one of those people who... They close their eyes when they're talking to you in condescending tones. <laughs> I don't think so. Where you're just like, well, you know, and then, of course, you probably aren't aware of this, but <laughs> and then eyes closed, they'll tell you something like, yeah, I know way yeah. more about that than you do, but <laughs> your eyes are closed and you seem to be having fun. So I'm just going to just sit here and pretend I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you should just, uh, you know, do the face where you pull your cheeks and stick out their tongue and then every time they do that. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's, this was a good way of, of trying to describe it to us noobs. He realized that no one was going to understand this um, flying electrical balloon type of thing. So he had to put it in some relatable terms. So he says, by producing with the aid of the electrical generator contained in this car, this is the car is also the electrical balloon, an enormous charge of electricity, Mr. Edison was able to counterbalance and a trifle more than counterbalance the attraction of the earth and thus cause the car to fly off from the earth as an electrified pith ball flies from the prime conductor. So I think ah. if you were having trouble grasping it, you just give them the electrified pith ball analogy, and it's like, oh, yep, it all clicked into place. Look, Garrett, I'm not your editor, but if I were, just say that. Just cut <laughs> right, to it. Right, and yeah. then the, the, uh, the penny drops, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. The old man in, uh, in, in Mousetrap does a backflip into the, into the pool, and that's, oh, we all understand <laughs> that then. Yes. <laughs> but the, uh, the trip to the moon... Uh, my only questions about it, like how long Mm -hmm. did, you know, did they bring sandwiches, jerky (laughs) and, and why is Garrett peace service? I mean, what, whoever our, you know, our intrepid, uh, narrator is, Mm -hmm. they don't really say like, you know, Edison doesn't go, ah, you're here, Mr. So-and-so because (laughs) of how 
<laughs> you just invented the, um, you know, tennis shoe, uh, which... <laughs> so there's no reason, but they just fly to the moon. And so those details are just kind of yeah. getting the, lost in his prose, is the, all I'm saying. The reason clicked for me about halfway through when I wrote down the, uh, the note. Like, these two are definitely uh, getting busy, right? Oh, like, okay. Is, <laughs> there's, uh, the, people were probably shipping these two back in, uh, in 1898 Tumblr. <laughs> but yeah, there's uh, no. I, 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 that, I hadn't occurred to me that maybe this wasn't Garrett P. Service in this uh, in this telling of the story. I just thought it was. Um, he just. But yeah, there's no indication of how he knows Thomas Thomas Edison or anything like that. Uh, but uh, what's your take on the illustration of the wizard and the astronomer confer? <laughs> you see that drawing there? You have yeah, it in your. I was right there. Uh, oh, so there, it says right there, a consultation in Wizard Edison's lab between him and Professor Service on the best means of repaying the damage wrought. And that looks sort of like the pictures we found of him. Oh, wait, he's an astronomer. Okay, we're discovering it right now. Okay, <laughs> he's a famous astronomer. It just says it above the picture. I guess you got to read the, oh, sure. the text around the pictures to understand what's happening. Yeah, I thought but it was it, a lawyer who then went to, became a journalist, so. I don't know. But, it, but the yeah. picture of uh, Edison... It, there's something very, it's like monstrous. His yeah. head is too large and his hands are too big. And then yeah. Garrett P. Service, uh, next to the wizard, looks <laughs> like a a normal uh, harumphing guy with a mustache and a receding hairline and a, a pince nez on his, perched on his nose. Yeah, and definitely. Uh, it's just very weird. Yeah, I, he, he looks like, Edison looks like, uh, you know, uh, he's holding like those... Uh, Hulk hands you can you can buy to like make your hands look like giant Hulk fists and yeah his head looks like a uh, a bobblehead almost so yeah he looks like a spitting image puppet you know those mm -hmm. things from the yeah <laughs> but uh, maybe that's a uh, maybe that's just how the fanfic worked then is like you know uh, when you wanted to indicate your respect and admiration for someone's intellect you drew them with huge hands and a big head and Grotesque. everyone just understood that <laughs> mm, I'm liking this guy yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but that's that's it for uh, chapter one. That's a quick trip to the moon. Yeah, the moon is is very much glossed over, and it says uh, the, the only other thing I had was that they they told the world that this is going to happen, and then uh, it says the utmost enthusiasm was aroused. Let the Martians come was the cry. So this is a cry. This is people crying out. Mm -hmm. Let the Martians come. If necessary, we can quit the earth as the Athenians fled from Athens before the advancing host of Xerxes and, like them, take refuge upon our ships, these new ships of space which, with which American inventiveness has furnished us. So people are, that, that's the cry, as, as he's deemed it. <laughs> uh, and then I, I think you could include the next paragraph in the cry. Yes. Because it, it does not say that it, uh, it, it, it's not part of it. Okay. Why should we wait? Why should we run the risk of having our cities destroyed and our lands desolated a second time? Let us go to Mars. We have the means. Let us beard the lion in his den. Let us destroy. Let us ourselves turn conquerors and take possession of that detestable planet and, if necessary, destroy it in order to relieve the Earth of that perpetual threat which now hangs over us like the sword of Damocles. <laughs> Hey, 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 Martin, really liked your cry there. Uh, what was all that stuff about bearding a lion in his den? That's, uh... We're yeah, talking about when I, when I get passionate, I just kind of cry out. It's like when you're at the Vikings game and you go, "Woo, yeah!" <laughs> uh, it's Sh like that. Sure, yeah. I mean, but like "woo" and "yeah" and, and "skull," those are all things you yell out. I mean, I, I, bearding the lion, woo, yeah. sword of Damocles. <laughs> I'm gonna jump through a table in the parking lot, woo. <laughs> bearding the lion does sound kind of dirty. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Then chapter two. <laughs> that starts off with a, a, a subheading called a wonderful instrument where we get this. The details of its mechanism could not easily be explained without the use of tedious technicalities and the employment of terms, diagrams, and mathematical statements, all which would lie outside the scope of its narrative. Okay, well, done with that. Why don't we move on? But the, the principle story? of the thing oh, is simple enough. God. It is a part of it. And then he goes on to talk about uh, substances all have their own vibratory rhythm. That of I He gives specific examples. That of iron differs from that of pine wood. <laughs> <laughs> the atoms of gold do not vibrate at the same time or through the same range of those of lead. Uh, no, and then he has this. 
A great suspension bridge vibrates under the impulse of forces that are applied to it in long periods. No company of soldiers ever crosses such a bridge without breaking step. If they tramped together and were followed by other companies keeping the same time with their feet, after a while the vibrations of the bridge would become so great and destructive it would fall for pieces. Yes, and then and then it goes on. So proven proof of concept, uh -huh. right? Guys go over a bridge; they don't tramp the same time. Therefore, isn't that what armies are known for, though? They like keeping lockstep. But they over the bridges, they do not do that. That's a well. That is a thing. Oh wow! Yeah, because it'll it'll uh, you know time the thing in a in a vibration. Uh -huh. Who knew? It has happened. Uh, but Mr. Edison had been able to ascertain the vibratory swing of many well-known substances. When was he doing this? <laughs> and how many substances? <laughs> and did, when was he thinking that this would be something? Like, uh, Edison, uh, you, you built half a light bulb, <laughs> and then you stepped away. Like, uh, And now you're sitting there... Uh, uh, charting the vibrations of frog skin or see mm. like what why are you doing that look have you seen how big my head is <laughs> <laughs> look at these hands <laughs> yeah and he's just he's just like you know the the, the bright vibrations of everything he is just going to be like all right now get goat leather all right that's different than <laughs> than, than horse leather uh sounds good well and then he so so he finds them mm -hmm. does he write them down and that, because this is uh we get to it. It's the disintegrator that he's making. Yes. And, you know, I, I assume ray gun, right? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. It's... He has to program into it <laughs> the, the different vibrations of, you know, paper, cardboard, number 10 paper. Uh, you know. <laughs> right. Paper with some uh, that someone has already, like, colored on with a crayon. Right. Oh, like how thick? Two crayons or just one crayon? Right. You know, yeah. different like... vibration. <laughs> Well, we uh, a listener wrote in to um, address this right now. We, I might as well read it now since it's related. This is from Heather, who says her husband was a physics major in college. And so uh -huh. she was wondering if the uh, law of harmonious vibration, uh, which is used as the basis of how the disintegrators work, uh, was, it was accurate at all. So she says she bounced it off her husband. And was he was thinking about spectrometers and how it knows what kind of elements are in a sample put into one, but he was unfamiliar with that law as stated. <laughs> so I put that exact phrase into Google and found a few links to either music sites that referred to vibrating strings, uh, reeds, and drum heads, but mostly I found links to pages about how everything on Earth, including our bodies, vibrate, and that we can concentrate to manipulate those vibrations to help with positive thinking, mentally attracting good things like money, and it can help us be in tune with nature and the universe. These were from sites like Spiritual Arts Institute, Institute and the Project Gallagher Institute. So in summary, Thomas A. Anderson is saving Earth from Mars with the power of woo. <laughs> and my God, well, it would have been incredible if the uh, Free River community yes. had been one of the first uh, examples from that. I feel like those uh, singing bowls. Yeah. Come on, it has to be a part of this whole. <laughs> Maybe that's uh, how his interest was piqued. He Googled it as well, found those, and it changed his life. Oh, my God. That's the... There's actually a pretty good possibility that that's true. <laughs> well, well, the good vibes are 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 uh, not not sure are fairly short lived here because we get the section testing the disintegrator, which I'm guessing is probably your favorite uh, ch chapter of of this book so far. I began laughing because <laughs> the test on the disintegrator, which you will describe, I I can't. Uh, it was hard for me. I'm sure the modern reader will be shocked by this. I, however, took great <laughs> delight in this, and people will understand soon. Why, why don't you tell them how they test okay. the disintegrator? He says, I had the good fortune to be present when this powerful engine of destruction was submitted to his first test. So he's just around on the roof of Edison's laboratory. Yes. Um, so, uh, very, again, very suspicious. Uh, the inventor held the little instrument with its attached mirror in his hand. We looked about for some object upon which to try its powers. On a bare limb of a tree not far away, for it was late in the fall, sat a disconsolate crow. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote, Crow snuff thick, Mike's ship has come in. <laughs> and Edison says, Edison doesn't talk a lot. He just does a lot of off-screen inventing. But he says, good. That will do. <laughs> so that's his little his crow killing quip. He touched a button at the side of the instrument, and a soft whirring noise was heard. 
Feathers, said Mr. Edison, have a vibration period of 386 million per second. I guess all feathers, you know, uh, crows versus duck down versus ostriches. Owls, yep. yes. Mm-hmm. He adjusted the index as he spoke, then through a sighting tube, he aimed at the bird. Now watch, he said. The crow's fate, the next subheading. Another soft whir in the instrument, a momentary flash of light close around it. And behold, the crow had turned from black to white. Its feathers are gone, said the inventor. They have been dissipated into their constant uh, constituent atoms. Now we will finish the crow. <laughs> he just so, wanted to get it nice and nude first. Crow humiliation follow. <laughs> and then there's a picture. This is there's one of the illustrations. Picture. And it has, yeah, a crow looking like a, you know, a plucked chicken that uh, Edison is blasting it as service looks on behind him wearing their bowler hats. Yeah, bowlers and uh, over top, top coats. And uh, disintegrating crows. Take its feathers off now. <laughs> yeah, right. What? What? Wh- how, what's the vibration of a crow wang? <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. Pants that oh. crow before we do. Oh, it. I measured that. Too. Yeah. I'm telling you that right now. Do it in front of his wife. Um, <laughs> but then, yeah, he he blasts the crow with another outshooting of vibratory force. A rapid up and down motion, I bet there was, uh, to indicate a certain range of vibrations, and the crow itself was gone, vanished in an empty space. And then Thomas Edison, who he often refers to as the wizard, just yes. like he was the wizard of Menlo Park, yes. just says, that looks bad for the Martians, doesn't it? Like, puts the sunglasses on. <laughs> <laughs> But then this is the best part. This is the best hand wave. He says, I have ascertained the vibration rate of all the materials of which their war engines, whose remains we have collected together, are composed. They can be shattered into nothingness in the fraction of a second. Even if the vibration period were not known, it could quickly be hit upon by simply running through the gamut. <laughs> so he's like, even if it, even if we don't know something, you just tur- turn the dial all the way to the left and then hold down the blast button and turn it all the way to the right, and it'll hit on the frequency somewhere in there. It's like programming your uh, remote control. Just uh, now try 3806. <laughs> Does the volume go up? <laughs> no, forcing your password. Three. Yeah. Yes. So that's pretty funny. So they need to test this, like, you know, pantsing a crow and then vaporizing it are one thing. <laughs> But, uh, you know, what are the vibrations of Martians and, you know, all of that stuff? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Again, we can figure it out. But is it powerful enough? Well, uh, and this is a little reminder. Oh, right. The world is is like, (laughs) yes, it's it's still uh, uh, it's 9-11 plus one. That's right. Uh, There's a, a crumbled wall. That uh, they decide like, oh, it's it, it's too dangerous to touch. So let's blow it up um, w- or let's uh, vaporize it with the disintegrator. In the heart of uh, Manhattan on Lower Broadway. Lower Broadway. <laughs> yes. Yeah, gigantic wall buildings. So And it's this is the lower wall is there. And it's like, well, we, we the fire department won't touch it because to blow it up seemed a dangerous expedient because already new buildings had been erected in its neighborhood and their safety would be imperiled by the flying fragments. It says that it uh, it threatened any moment to fall upon the heads of passerbys. It's like maybe take care of it before you start putting up your uh, your luxury condos in its uh, you know talk about a sword of Damocles. Yeah, they're so they're issuing building permits, and uh, you know the people building it like, can I uh, take that wall down? Well, I wouldn't if I were you. <laughs> yeah, that's a load bearing ruin. <laughs> But yeah, uh, he says, uh, he, service tells uh, Edison about that, and Edison says, capital, I shall go at once. So it is just sort of like, you know, when, when Richard Branson is like, you know, going into space, it's like, don't you have a company that you should be running? Like, you know, Edison is just going to blast crows and walls as uh, everyone else is sort of wondering, like, you know, yeah, should we finish inventing the light bulb? Yeah, so service is standing over his shoulder. He watches him disintegrate a crow, and then he's like, you should go, like, take down this building in uh, on Broadway. Like, <laughs> yeah. okay. So service, you know, while he's like wiring some complex thing up, is just like, you see that dumpster over there? There's half a chicken sandwich. You should eat it. Yeah. Sounds good. I yeah. shall do it. <laughs> Check out the uh, lady across the street. What if you evaporated her petticoat? I shall do it at once. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's, the, uh, he's the grim worm tongue of Thomas Edison. <laughs> So uh, so they do it, but they set up a, a big crowd. Yeah. Because they want to let people know, like, you know, we're going to 
obviously the Martians are doomed, but we want to give people hope. People uh, had hope. They were talking about bearding lions as soon as he even announced this. Which I, I have to say, as all this is happening, all those people who were who died in that mass suicide must be going like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> They're bearding lions now. <laughs> ah, wow! Yeah, just if you had even hinted you'd be bearding lions, I could have. I could have given myself another week. Ah, why did I open my vein in the tub? <laughs> ah. um, but yeah, they 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 gather the crowd. They evaporate the wall. I mean, it looks just fine. Uh, it, you know, it evaporates in a faint bluish cloud that are the scattered atoms of it. And then another cry goes up. The uh, is heard on all sides. The cry on to Mars. You know, so that's that's all the uh, that's all the convincing they knew. They they evaporated a wall and a Therefore, crow. Therefore, death yep. of the Martians. Therefore, yep, the electric balloons can take care of this. <laughs> and it says uh, all the nations then must conjoin. They must unite their resources and, if necessary, exhaust all their hordes in order to raise the needed sum. So uh, the first uh, distinctly eerie parallel to super constitution has raised its head here. Oh my gosh, this chilled my blood. Uh, first of all, the, you know, blood chilling uh, subhead, the Yankees lead, oh, yeah. which, you know, as a twins fan, Must I'm immediately twins, like, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> uh, but uh, here we go. Negotiations were at once begun. The United States naturally took the lead and their leadership was never for a moment questioned abroad. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> oh, yes. As we enter into what I, as I recall, probably the most peaceful uh, 50 years in the history of the planet, uh, doesn't seem like that would raise any eyebrows. It is astonishing. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, I just immediately wrote, oh boy, so here, you know, here it comes, super constitution. And does it ever? Yeah. It, it not for a moment veers from it. Yeah. They here. begin, they assemble everyone, and the speeches begin. <laughs> Yeah, and it's very entertaining because you read about the he he just names drops some more contemporary leaders. So it's funny to just see you know who these big shots were that were going to be flocking to uh, the U.S. to to D.C. to all of a sudden um, you know lend all resources necessary that the uh, that America needs. It's Queen Victoria, Emperor William, Tsar Nicholas, Alfonso of Spain with his mother Maria Christina. Uh, and he just sort of starts listing all these people that were probably going to be assassinated within the decade here. Uh, uh, they were either dead by assassination or they wrought World War I yes. upon us not long after this. So right. it's, it's good that they have this distraction. So in this fiction, I don't think World War I happens for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, since they're all united here to do this. I mean, there's a few that, that uh, a few get snubbed, though. He does say, he starts saying, he lists all these names, then he starts, like, just saying, uh, generalizing, you know, uh, the president of France, the president of Switzerland. He didn't look up their names. The first syndic of the Little Republic of Andorra perched on the crest of the Pyrenees. It's like, all right, you, you probably could have left them out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sounds like maybe you studied abroad there or something. But then he says, <laughs> And the heads of all the Central and South American republics. <laughs> so. he, he, went to, uh, he went to college with a guy who uh, then moved to the crest of the Pyrenees and was right. like, hey, man, if you ever write a book, like, shout me out, man. Yeah, we got, a great, like, oh. we got a great free river community going on out there if you ever want to come out and just, you know, <laughs> just really groove for a weekend. <laughs> But uh, yeah, but, he, the uh, the Central and South America get the uh, Ernest Cline and a variety of '80s dance moves from being performed, and the rest. Yes, Gilligan's Island. <laughs> and oh, this is where I had my first note that said they these two are banging. It's uh, you know, they 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 they, they are going to fly out to watch like the ships coming in. It says this will be a fine spectacle. Would you like to watch it? Certainly, I replied. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why that uh, why that triggered it for me, but uh, and this is where they. They just fly all over looking at all these people like happily coming to D.C., right? Is that where they're coming? Yes. Yeah, it's uh, Neil Diamond's uh, Coming to America is playing as this montage happens. They see the, sh the black ships of Russia. They, they see the, the uh, English ships in the Channel, the British fleet. Um, and then there's the little contretemps with Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> Yeah. But he he comes around. I thought that was very funny. <laughs> yeah. He uh, they, they so Kaiser Wilhelm said like uh, he's a little little skeptical of it, 
And uh, it says, my, my glorious ancestors, uh, off-putting, would never have consented to allow these upstart Republicans to lead in a warlike enterprise of this kind. What would my grandfather have said to it? I suspect that it is some scheme aimed at the divine right of kings. But the good sense of the German people would not suffer their ruler to place them in a position so false and so untenable. <laughs> oh, about that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep, there's a, a couple of eyebrow razors in this thing, but yeah. what are you going to do? Uh, he, he refers to the uh, ship as the ship of space that uh, Edison is flying around in. So he's very, very close to getting uh, the term. And he, uh, he w- once more uses um, this analogy to describe how it works. It says, in such a case, of course, the car would fly toward the object, whatever it might be. Like a pith ball or a feather. So it's really, it's really banking on uh, your average Joe uh, relating to that. Uh, and uh, he, so he flies to the, uh, to the west, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, to see things coming from the east. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if he was going to see the steam man of the prairies at some point in time. I, I'm sure he passed over low. <laughs> he probably uh, knocked his hat off or something as he went by. <laughs> uh, halfway between the American coast and Hawaii... We met the fleets coming from China and Japan. Side by side, they were plowing the main, having forgotten or laid aside all the animosities of their former wars. <laughs> wow. Yes. Bygones. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's it's climbing in as well with the uh, that we cured cancer and all other diseases. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> centuries of just the most bitter Horrible things happening that two nations can impose upon each other, and more to come, uh, as we would see. But uh, no, their fleets were side by side. They were, you know, chucking their uh, Sapporos and their Ching Taos back and forth across <laughs> to each other. Try this one, brother. Yeah. All right. Hey, eat our wake. Oh, oh, oh no, you guys are all right. Yeah. Here, have a rising moon here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't look it up. I, I don't know enough about the history to know what the greatest atrocities they uh, have committed against each other in their history, but I'm sure they would be jaw-dropping. Well, I think the the the, their, the war had just ended um, maybe five years before. Oh, there was a war just in the, the in the 1890s? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, the, the, first, the first of, of two. Um, but yeah, I don't know much about it, but uh, I think that, that it was a couple years before that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So bygones. Look, you forgive your genocide. We'll forgive ours. Just because we heard that Edison has invented an electrical balloon ship of space. That's I all. Thought we were, <laughs> I thought we were seeing the steam man of the prairies. <laughs> uh, we can stop. Yeah. No, he's the keynote speaker. <laughs> um, and uh, that's the end of uh, chapter two, I think. Mm hmm. Chapter three goes full out super constitution. Yeah, we are in a Senate chamber. It goes, uh, it, yeah, it goes Star Wars uh, uh, prequel kind of stuff here, right? Yeah, definitely. Just go into a chamber and have speeches mm-hmm. with uh, uh, just you know a lot of people who he says you know talks about like Queen Victoria and assumes everyone will know who they are. Um, the the Czar of Russia. Um, and then equally warm were the greetings extended to the representatives of Mexico and the South American states. <laughs> so he gives it to them yet again, uh, the, uh, the hand wave away, which is just a, an interesting and peculiar tick. Uh, the Sultan of Turkey, everyone was happy to see. Yeah, uh, but they, yeah. Ha- they hardly knew at first how to receive him. But the universal good feeling was in his favor. And finally, rounds of hand clapping and cheers greeted his progress along the splendid avenue. It just seemed like an odd thing to single out. (laughs) Uh, But no time was wasted in preliminaries. The president made a brief speech. Yes. Oh, boy. (laughs) But here, this is good. None of us has yet recovered from the effects of the recent invasion. The earth is poor today compared to its position a few years ago. Yet we cannot allow our poverty to stand in the way. Also, everyone is dead. (laughs) Like millions were killed, right? He talks about all the cities being destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, He doesn't mention his own consternation, but I assume it's there. (laughs) Yeah. Let consternation be left in 1897. We will move the forward. The only consternation we have to fear is consternation itself. Yes, yes McKinley talks like a uh, JFK and uh, FDR combined. <laughs> yes. And it is McKinley. That's not addressed in the text, but it is specified in the interstitial. That's, that was McKinley's tribute. It was McKinley. And the fact that he got no uh, weird drawing with large hands and a puppet head. Ooh. 
Yep. So that speaks volumes oh, about what uh, Mr. Volumes. Service thinks of him. Because it does have a, a picture of him right here, right? He's greeting Queen Victoria and uh, and then the rest. Oh, there he is. Yeah, he looks very much just like how you would picture McKinley <laughs> looking, <laughs> as um, does Victoria. Victoria, and then there's a guy who looks like Stalin, a guy who's probably supposed to be a, a matador, so probably from Spain or one of the uh, one of those other countries that he, he doesn't deign to identify their leader. They all look in the in the drawing in the pencil drawing. They all look pretty grim, and, and this seems to be a rather jolly affair. Everyone's there's talk of smiling and hand pumping, and yeah, hey, people are doing the, the Arsenio Sultan. like woo woo type of thing, yes. like when the Turkish guy starts dancing. <laughs> yeah, they right. all look like a, a sort of a, one of those realistic looking drawings from Monty Python type of thing, right? Like, yes, like yeah, one of those and animation the, um, between. Um, uh, McKinley and uh, the the guy who it must be the czar. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming between them is some guy with a, like a tri cornered hat, but it looks like Bob Newhart to me. So, <laughs> nice. so you can check out the drawing if you well, want. Well, yeah, that's uh, maybe he predicted Bob Newhart. That's one of the other <laughs> things he he did. Um, but yeah, so we have to keep McKinley in mind because there's a very fun fact about that coming up. Uh, but he, he here we go. He says uh, Edison says Edison to the rescue. Uh, one of Edison's deputies says, I think that a simple exhibition of the powers of the instrument without a technical explanation of its method of working will suffice for our purposes. So, <laughs> got it. <laughs> you won't explain it. Mr. Edison also explained in general terms the principle on which the Edison uh, instrument worked. Son of a bitch. He can't, keep, he can't keep getting away with this. But he said, I, uh, this seems dickish to me. I don't know uh, for our hero to do. I can explain its details to Lord Kelvin, for instance, but if their majesties will excuse me, I doubt whether I can make it plain for the crowned heads. <laughs> you suck. We no longer like you. Yeah, really. Oh, he got us good. It turns into a roast. But as he explained his thing, like you were just reading, he explained in general terms, he was greeted with round after round of applause. Wow. So it's like, could, could you... Let me just get to the part where the, the vibration. Oh, God. All right. Mm-hmm. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Crow feathers disappear. Applause. Crow disappears. Uh, more applause. Uh, uh, this is worse than the State of the Union. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what they do is they make a, uh, a jar of ink disappear under the nose of Emperor William. Um, and that's sort of uh, what what, uh, what impresses everybody. That's their demonstration there. Clearly, we can, again, take on Mars. <laughs> Walls and ink can be disappeared at, at will. The, uh, they start then, since they're all gathered in the Senate or whatever, tossing out, uh, you know, getting down to logistics of the thing. And they start talking about money. And this is where I got very confused because uh, they say, how much will be needed? At least 10,000 millions of dollars, <laughs> replied the president. And then another senator says, it would be safer to make it 25,000 millions. <laughs> I was just—is this how people talked back then? That, I had never heard of it before. Yeah, I think that was the old way to to convey instead of saying the word millions, and like we did a little bit of a deep dive on you know billion. Yeah, which the UK thinks we are just idiots for using <laughs> that. Billion is a million million, and yeah. not. A thousand. Settle the hell down, UK. <laughs> yes. So yeah, but billion had been around since like, we, we looked it up and people sent it in, like you know the 1600s or the something like that. So they 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 had a word for it. It just was uh you know maybe no one had that much money, so it wasn't even worth addressing. You know, right? Uh, but they were talking about all this stuff, and and I think I'd mentioned this in one of our previous things about how people would go to uh, fundraising things for canals. Mm-hmm. And just go bananas, like loved it. Like, yeah, we're going to build another canal. Like, no, you're kidding me. This is too good of news. And then well, here, where's my checkbook? And it's that's like a what bachelor happens. auction. Yes, and that's what happens here. And uh, so excited that uh, one of the Roko Tui's or native chiefs from Fiji sprang up and brandished a war club. <laughs> Are you are you frisking these guys as they're near yeah. our president? That's probably a good idea, yeah, because, uh, you know, d- d- flash forward service, it doesn't necessarily work out for uh, McKinley well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's addressed with a, uh, one of the more unfortunate illustrations in the book. It's, uh, yes, you know, sure. you're, you're not getting through a, uh, an 1890s tome without some casual racism here. Sure. Uh, which uh, which uh, is not, not the last time that's going to happen here either. No, we're going to have uh, to tiptoe around those. <laughs> 
Um, and then, yeah, so, but yeah, people keep saying, we'll give a thousand million dollars as a chancellor. And, uh, but then the, uh, the king of Siam makes yes. quite, a, quite a curious contribution here. Do you want to, do you want to address that? Well, yeah. So, uh, my friends of the Western world, continued the king of Siam, will be interested in seeing this gem. Um, we said cash only. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> we made that very clear at the beginning. <laughs> yeah. You're going to give us a, a, a coupon? No IOUs here. Come on. <laughs> well, uh, oh, I'll just take this down to the pawn shop, I guess, and we'll build some electric balloons from it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Ass. No, this this is a uh, this is a, a Frank Thomas rookie card that's going to soar uh, once he gets into the <laughs> Hall of Fame. Uh, trust me on that one. It's, uh, this Trump is, is a uh, a lottery ticket. They're reading the numbers three nights from tonight. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I knew we should not have invited that guy from the uh, the stem of the Pyrenees or whatever he called it. <laughs> Where the hell is Siam anywhere, King? <laughs> but so he uh, he essentially says um, this is um, a, a very fancy gem. The Great Mogul Diamond. Uh, how it came into my possession, I shall not explain. At any rate, it is honestly mine. <laughs> <laughs> well. So we, we didn't doubt it until you brought this up, man. Like, <laughs> Again, the pawn shop owner cocks his head at him. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to need to see some uh, yeah, two papers forms of ID. <laughs> <laughs> you mind if I make a call to the guy you say you got this from? Oh, uh, do you really uh, need to? Uh, he's not going to be home, I yeah, don't think. Okay, I'm kind of, kind of in a hurry. The car's running outside. <laughs> But so yeah, that's his contribution to the whole thing, and I guess they do, they do have to find some way to to liquidate it. But uh, as they've said all this money, they're talking about this. They pretty much say, uh, "Hey Edison, like how long is this going to take?" And Edison goes, "Give me carte blanche, and I believe I can have a hundred electric ships and three thousand disintegrators ready within six months." A tremendous cheer greeted this announcement. Uh, so yeah, again, invention anyone any any. Uh, tech guy any uh, any local billionaire uh, being given carte blanche by uh, the the government to develop 3000 disintegrator rays and the horror that would greet that announcement i wonder if uh, like raytheon demands that of like the chiefs of staff right. you know yeah. like, uh, all i want you to do is not ask me a single question <laughs> and just keep the money coming <laughs> but th this is the thing the right before that they they gavel it shut when they you know, have the money because they all are excited to outbid each other how much money they're giving, <laughs> which, you know, the citizens of each of these countries has nothing to say about the matter. Yeah. Think about uh, it, how much, you know, poverty and horrible living conditions existed in all of these countries at this point in time. Can we have one of those thousands of million to make indoor plumbing? No. All right. No, but just got bid on this thing. But upon taking the sum of the contributions, the great mogul was reckoned at three millions. Was it now? Is there a gemologist just sitting there? Anyway, it was found to be still 1,000 million short of the required amount, which they get, of course. But uh, none of the contributors wanted to see the budget at all. Right. They were just all in. Like, you know, Edison's sitting right there. Like, how much is each one of them? Like, um, what did you say was the amount we needed? Yeah, yeah each one is of uh, whatever the fraction is of that. <laughs> right. uh, I, there's a line item of, uh, you know... 5,000 million to get the Wright brothers to record a, a PSA here. Do we really need to do that? Like, oh yeah, it's going to be, they're going to like, you know, walk through this hall and call everybody bitches like Matt Damon if they don't contribute to the effort. Well, what I see a line item here for 10,000 crows. What's, uh, what's going on with that? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Quiet. I said carte blanche. Yeah. Silk robe for my trusted advisor, Garrett P. Service. What is that all about? <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, where are we? Okay. Well, uh, we get to a uh, a uh, re the um, the Chinese legend. It says, "Oh that, yes, yeah." Uh, boy. Well, it says that uh, the the people are are mad with joy about this. Um, yeah, again, it, the people who killed themselves <laughs> should have hung on. People right. are mad with joy. They're absolutely outrageously <laughs> exultation was so great. <laughs> but then uh, Edison says he's going to take all these dignitaries for like a a ride in his. Um, car or whatever um yeah electrical ship yes but uh not interested is the um emperor of china who repeats a fable which he said come down from the time of confucius and uh essentially just says like um if you don't have feathers or wings you should leave it to the birds um after he repeats something that is obviously just something service made up that sounded like a uh, an old confucius tale 
I, I wonder during this part, like they're, we're all waiting to kind of load into these electric ships and take this nice ride. And he says, you know, essentially, if I may per- be permitted to tell this story, and everyone's like, okay, oh, yes. And then it, it's literally like it's it's a thousand words long. <laughs> yes, it's. A... And you, there had to be like looking at pocket watches and. <clears throat> just a Chinaman. Can we go? <clears throat> it's really going to be, uh, you know, the whole thing depends on, I, I could explain it to you, but the whole thing depends on the lunar gravity, which is then transformed into electrical waves. Oh, I said I wasn't going to explain it, but we really should go now. I don't you know, oh, Come on. <laughs> so I guess that's supposed to be a little, that's a funny thing. That's what a man from China would do. We tell a little tail and then uh, they i think they sort of giggle at that is, is my guess yeah they he turns his back on the ship but it's like i don't know sweet more room for the rest of us like yeah <laughs> uh and uh they, so they say that um once this is done what do we do well edison said he needed six months so we might as well have a grand ball to celebrate all this stuff <sighs> which uh, constitution again and, uh-huh and the suggestion met with immediate and universal approval <laughs> 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 and they so they, they what do they do they they level they go out and level like ten acres of of woods outside of D.C. and erect like they erect like a mini city that were for everyone to like have this ball it's like the Olympic Village or something a space of ten acres was carefully leveled and covered with a polished floor rows of columns one hundred feet apart were run across it in every direction and they were decorated with electric lights displaying every color of the spectrum. <laughs> Meanwhile, a, f- a family in rags stumbles by and their child dies in front of their eyes because there's no food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This could be what provokes World War One is once people finally get wind of this, you know, three years later, once the news travels back, that this is what they did with all the money. Like there's going to be a huge uprising. Right. And so now we get like this is just a time to uh, we're obviously going to win this war is the the, the scene that's going on. People are just delighted mm-hmm. and people all in one voice love that all these dignitaries put on their you know fifteen thousand dollar dresses and go yeah. uh, waltz in, on a uh, polished floor that they <laughs> plowed their home down to make yeah yeah it's but uh during the the middle of it the king of siam essayed a waltz with queen rana valona of madagascar <laughs> while the sultan of turkey basked in the smiles of a chicago heiress to a hundred millions <laughs> Sultan of Turkey, boom. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, get it done. She hasn't given away her thousands of millions. <laughs> yes. And turning into Edison's key party. <laughs> but listen to this dance. This is a fun little uh, fun little fact. The Prince of Wales led forth the fair daughter of the president, universally admired as the most beautiful woman upon the great ballroom floor. So did you look up uh, what, what McKinley's daughter looked like? I did not. So, well, that's a shame because you... You would have seen uh, the picture of her uh, as a four-year-old, which is when she died. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> he had a four-year-old die, and he had another daughter who died uh, before she turned one. Those were his two oh. children, which uh, you think you probably would have heard about if you were, uh, you know, the, the president <laughs> had suffered two uh, children deaths. It's a very odd detail for uh, for service to include here. Wow, Garrett P., maybe he really does hate him, trying to remind him of his... Uh... You know, this could have been, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> You'd been a better father. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, um, it pretty much has everyone dancing to their local music. So it sort of turns into 1800s. It's a small world after all. You know, like everyone's doing the, the Russian guys are doing that Russian dance. And, um, you know, German guys are blowing, you know, Alpen horns and stuff like that. And then uh, uh, the Emperor of China, who was, you know, sort of a downer on the last time, comes in and, um, Therapy service has has transcribed his words exactly to uh, mm-hmm. to be, essentially be Mickey Rooney here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's a uh, should we read him? It says make moochie noisy, Ollie same moochie flayed noise, and then his round face dimpled into another laugh. So that's uh, you know the the uh, the great sci fi work of Edison's conquest of Mars there. I don't even, I, I couldn't even figure out what he was trying to say. He's like, they, they I says, assume he was afraid of the noise of the yeah. musicians, but I didn't, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's their little, like, um, ring, our, whoever, they, forget who we sent the gong to, but he can play it every time one of those moments happens in this book. Uh, then we get probably one of my favorite sentences in any book. Mm-hmm. Um this is a speech, I think, by... Prince of Wales? Oh, this is the toast. 
the toast. <laughs> yes, from the Prince of Wales. Uh, right. I, I am quoting someone, please. So, uh, so don't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He says in it, when all racial differences and prejudices ought to be and are buried and forgotten, I should not recall anything that might even that might revive them. Oh, well, that's that's, that's great news. Yeah. That's a nice sentiment, it's especially at this time. Embodies, yeah, what this has all come together for. Wonderful. So let's Good. raise it. No, I'm not done. <laughs> Yet I cannot refrain from expressing my happiness and knowing that the champion has to, who is to achieve the salvation of Earth has come forth from the bosom of the Anglo-Saxon race. <laughs> <laughs> his uh his envoy like tugging at his coat like have a seat <laughs> no hang on hang on i'm not a racist yeah. but no no sit, sit down we sit really down. you had left no doubt about that with the depiction of the chinese emperor mere paragraphs before sir so <laughs> so yeah oh. they so the There's a next chap I met in uh, in Germany called Hitler. He has a young son. I love these guys. Oh, sit, sit down. Sit down. Talk about good ideas. I. Uh, <laughs> so the next day's newspaper is gonna. You know, the the biggest headline is you know uh, Prince of Wales racist remarks, and then a much smaller thing on page you know B three. Oh, by the way, we're going to defeat the Martians. Like it sort of <laughs> sort of overshadows what should have been a nice evening. Oh yes, and then. Uh, I didn't quite understand this. The Emperor William, uh, something happens to him. I don't know what happens, but he says, I want to go home. If I am to die, I prefer to leave my bones among those of my imperial ancestors and not in this vulgar country where no king has ever ruled. I don't like this atmosphere. It makes me feel limp. (laughs) Settle the hell. You're an emperor, for God's sake. (laughs) You're stomping your feet and crying at this. That's... I mean, I don't know. He he was probably dancing with someone, and then the, uh, the you know head of Turkey came up and uh, you know made off with his Chicago heiress. Yeah, the Sultan of Turkey, and Tur- like he behind his back gave him the middle finger, you know, as he walked off with yeah, the woman. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about limp. <laughs> Not going to be a problem here. Uh, speaking of uh, weird, pervy sounding things, um, it says that. Hardly the excitement caused by reading of this ditch patch subsided when others of similar import came from the Lick Observatory in California. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. It sounds like, uh, <laughs> who knows what's going on over there. That's uh, Edison and service I got to get over there. But I also like this sentence because this is uh, nothing, you know, nothing makes you feel confident in something uh, that's going to uh, succeed like some good old fashioned hubris it says all around it and from some of the balloons themselves rose jets and fountains of fire ceaselessly playing and blotting out the constellations of the heavens by their splendor so you know bl- blotting out the heavens usually has uh, has ended well for anyone who tries it we are unsinkable ladies and gentlemen <laughs> And uh, the only other thing I had was the uh, the one of the final uh, subchapter heading for this one was what's happening on Mars, which is just uh, imagining Martian rerun doing his dance was pretty entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure that's in the works. What's happening on Mars? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that ends chapter three. But uh, we, before we move on, we should probably get our first Edison's Conquest of Mars fanfic out of the way. Fanfic. <laughs> All right, so people have uh, submitted their fanfic for this, and this is definitely a tricky one because, as we've hopefully indicated, it has a very 1890s style about it. It's uh, so there's hard to hard to really latch onto it. I think in this first section, we've we've universally seen, but our, our Patreon supporters have have done their done their best to try to trick you here. Um, and uh, might I add, you know, contemporaneous figures are all over the book, so. It'll be hilarious to see if someone <laughs> fools me with like right. an old timey character. Like you thought he was actually in the book. Like, hey, <laughs> right. Come on, man! The Sultan of Turkey's right here. Right? Yeah. Uh, the Theodore Roosevelt's son Kermit was uh, heard to. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these are going to be five passages that are either from later in Edison's Conquest of Mars or fanfic written by our uh, beloved. Um, uh, generous, good-looking Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash 372 pages. We are nearing a 1,000. We are Woo. nearing a 1,000. I think we promised we would watch Forrest Gump uh, when that happened. So, yes. uh, boy, <laughs> maybe just keep it at nine ninety nine, folks. This yeah. is, <laughs> that's a, like a two-and-a-half-hour-long movie. But, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue to do that. If we, uh, if, we, if we do get in touch with the, uh, 
the founder of uh, Free River Community will post that over there too. But right. uh, here we go, five, five excerpts. Mm -hmm. I should be thought a liar if I relate the next events, and yet I shall relate them even so. I was astonished, not to say dismayed, to learn that the female of the Martian species also smoked the leaf of their kid verb plant. And the manner in which I learned this was most extraordinary. For Lord Kelvin emerged from his bath in the kid verb house and was accompanied by one of these unbeauteous females and both smoking the kid verb pipe. Yes, observed Mr. Edison, the heart of the female vibrates at a frequency that Lord Kelvin certainly understands well, though at the time I did not yet fully understand this most cryptic comment. Mmm, medicinal plants, you say? Yes. <laughs> um... I think that's fanfic. Okay. Number two. Looking about among the Martians by whom we were surrounded, it soon became easy for us to tell who were the soldiers and who were the civilians simply by the appearance of their bodies, and particularly of their heads. All members of the military class resembled, to a greater or less extent, the monarch himself, in that those parts of this, their skulls which our phrenologists had designated as the bumps of destructiveness, combativeness, and so on, were enormously and disproportionately developed. And all this, as we were assured, was completely under the control of the Martians themselves. They had learned or invented methods by which the brain itself could be manipulated, so to speak, and any desired portions of it could be specially developed, while the other parts of it were left to their normal growth. The consequence was that in the Martian schools and colleges, there was no teaching in our sense of the word. It was all brain culture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could see the phrenologist uh, dangling those little bait in front of me and uh, gosh i want to take it but i'm going to say that's fanfic all right number three uh subtitle clever ministrations the technical details of the levitating healing device conceived by edison and famed physiologist jacques arsène de arsonneval are of little concern to the reader it combines the capability of my inductorium with the disintegrator explained mr edison Turning to, to, uh, turning to the Frenchman, a physician need only orient one of the 12 sides of this device toward the patient before initiating treatment, said Dr. Darsonval. Each side is tuned to treat specific maladies. Once engaged, its emitted rays will heal their ailments. Disorders of blood circulation, central nervous system, cancerous sarcomas, and tuberculosis may be cured at once. Our men no longer fear falling to Mars's pestilences as the Martians fell prey to Earth's. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's clever. They found that little. <laughs> I need hardly explain to you, and then explaining it. So, I uh, I don't. I'll bite. I'll say that's real. Okay. Number four. It was at that time that I, along with the great crowd of scientists, laid our eyes upon one of the great Martian canal barges. Subheader: The Martian Canal Barge. The Martian Canal Barge was similar in size and displacement to a riverine gunboat of the sort used by the United States Navy's Yangtze River Patrol. But this Martian vessel had no obvious smokestacks or sails. Similarly perplexing, there was no screw propeller. After some investigation, Mr. Edison was, was able to unravel the mystery of its propulsion. Propulsion was accomplished with the generation of vibrational waves from an emitter mounted on the bow. To propel forward, vibratory waves of a negative polarity issued forth from the emitter and drew the barge forward th toward a positively charged metallic lattice which covered the overhead space of the canal like an arbor. This propulsion was similar to how a negatively charged gold leaf coated plunger on an electroscope is drawn toward a positively charged brass rod, turning the cranks. I wondered aloud as to the source of the barge's electricity. The barge's emitter was powered by a series of hand cranks spread across the deck. These were most likely intended for human slaves. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to say, I honestly, have no, I'm tossing a coin. I'm going to say fanfic. All right. And the last one, number five. What in the world makes me so heavy, I asked. Yes, indeed. What an elephant you have become, said Mr. Edison. Lord Kelvin screwed his eyeglasses in. Lord, sorry. Lord Kelvin screwed his eyeglass in his eye and carefully inspected the balance. It's quite right, he said. You do indeed weigh five ounces and a quarter. Too much, altogether too much, he added. You shouldn't do it, you know. Perhaps the fault is in the asteroids, suggested Professor Sylvanus P. Thompson. 
quite so, exclaimed Lord Kelvin, a look of sudden comprehension overspreading his features. No doubt it is the internal constitution of the asteroid which is the cause of this anomaly. We must look into that. Let me see. The gentleman's weight is three and one-half times as great as it ought to be. What element is there whose density exceeds the mean density of the earth in about that proportion? Gold, exclaimed one of the party. For a moment we were startled beyond expression. The truth had flashed upon us. This must be a golden planet. <laughs> well, well, well. Hmm. It's playing upon the, yeah, the diamonds on the moon kind of a thing. I don't know. All right. I'll say that's real. Okay. Well, for the first one, I don't think you did that bad. I'll say that out front. Okay. It's tricky, though. These are, this is a... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was in the middle of reading one. I was like, I don't remember if this was real or fancy. <laughs> uh, number one. Number one was the uh, kid verb pipe and the unbeauteous females of the Martian race. Uh, you said fanfic. That was fanfic submitted by Jackson. Okay. Jackson is probably the only uh, listener of ours who has been in our house, in my house. What? Uh, he, he's, uh, he, I met him at a Jeopardy audition, and he was in town one time. He's a, uh, he's a uh, professor of uh, Norse uh, studies and myths. So, Good Lord. Yeah, he's a cool guy. <laughs> uh, let's see. Number two. Uh, this is, brother, uh, the phrenology yes. and the, uh, the brain culture. You said fanfic. That is real from later in the book. Oh, come on. <laughs> Submitted by Curtis. It they was brought all phrenologists to Mars. Yeah, they yeah, they packed them all in. Those were probably their most famous scientists. I hope we get a oh. I hope we get the name of a uh, actual phrenologist. Number 3. Uh, this was uh, clever ministrations. Uh, oh, um, uh, the physicians uh, turning a device to treat the uh, diseases so we no longer fear falling to Mars's pestilence. You said real. This was fanfic written by Craig. Mm. <laughs> uh, but he says uh, Edison really did invent a, quote, medical device called the Indoctorium. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so a little thing. And he also said the 12-sided device was a nod towards the, uh, the, the, the great presence in the end of Armada. So very clever. <laughs> So that was, yeah, that was by Craig. Uh, number four. So what are you right now? I am uh, one, for three? one for three. Okay. Well, so number four. Hardly did well. <laughs> number four, you said this was the Martian Canal Barge, and the Martians have a ship that is they fear is going to be powered by Earth slaves. Uh, you said fanfic. That was fanfic written by Charles. Okay. I did like that multiple people uh, uh, put um, the little subheadings into their things. That was very funny. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, so that's two for four. And then the final one was the uh, gold planets, and it's affecting his weight. You said real, and that is real from later in the book. That is submitted by Chap. All right. Kept my head above water just yeah. barely. <laughs> yeah, those are tough. I mean, come on. Phrenology? Yeah. People, people give me that one. What? I mean, when was the height of phrenology? We're going to have to look into that. that yeah. Seems, it seems like this is, you know, has got to be around there. You know, the, the phrenologies are being like, I don't know about these x-rays. Seems a little uh, suspicious to me. You've got to stick with what works is what a good old fresh in phrenology. I was at my uh, brother-in-law's cabin uh, a couple weeks ago, and they he has a, a garage where he kind of collects some stuff nicely he's not a he's not a hoarder it's like good stuff uh -huh. but he had uh, edison cylinders wow and i said where in the world did you get this <laughs> he was there's this old guy who lived you know a couple miles away who was like uh his wife gave it to him and he said why are you giving this to me because he said she goes i gotta get rid of this old piece of junk and he said give it to that crazy guy up on the hill <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's the crazy guy uh oh. but yeah we connected the horn you know, and then we flip the little cylinders on there and put it down, and then you can just barely hear like, <laughs> "Wow, amazing. amazing!" And he had a big collection of wax cylinders. There. <laughs> so, continuing the uh, hilarious tradition of uh, people you know getting willed uh, cool or valuable stuff, and uh, yes, your main indeed. finding in the will were the Home Depot buckets full of <laughs> full, full of waste. Yes, yes. <laughs> very nice. Let's do uh, chapter four. Well, chapter four starts with a, a big bang <laughs> in which Garrett P. Service, believe it or not, tells us that uh, he's not going to tell us something. He says, it is not necessary for me to describe the manner in which Mr. Edison performed his tremendous task. And for the first time, he really just doesn't do it. He just says, yep, six months passed. And uh, then we had uh, 3,000 disintegrators and flying machines. Yes. 
Uh, and as he pointed out, the war machines which the Martians had employed in their invasion on Earth were really very awkward and unmanageable affairs. <laughs> Mr. Edison's electric ships, on the other hand, were marvels of speed and manageability. Well, I mean, they, they laid waste to the entire planet. <laughs> yeah, but it's embarrassing that they did that with how, <laughs> how ju- juvenile and awkward they were. It just seemed an odd thing at this point. Like, um, <laughs> this guys, this is not in the bag. I don't understand. Yeah, it, it was very funny to be like, yeah. Well, imagine, imagine how many of them we're gonna kill with these awesome machines. It's, <laughs> <laughs> people, yeah, I, and yeah, I guess we haven't read War of the World, so we have no idea what the Martians did that for. But I, it could be just the like the three body problem where it's like if you learn about another civilization not another planet it's your duty to wipe them out because one day they will get the technology to wipe you out that could just be what it comes down to uh, i like it it also says mr uh mr edison or it says they could the, the ships they could dart about turn reverse their course rise fall with the quickness and ease of a fish in water mr edison calculated that even if mysterious bolts should fall upon our ships we could diminish their power to cause injury by our rapid evolutions. So it's like Mr. Edison was just saying a bunch of shit all the time. Like we put a lot of trust that he wasn't bullshitting us. Yeah. And they were totally happy to believe him. I I love that. He doesn't, you know, there's not even a, uh, who wants to be on the board that oversees Mr. (laughs) Edison's things. Like, ah, we don't need one. Dancing with Queen Victoria. Can't be bothered. That'd be great. If it was like the six months pass. And they, uh, you know, knock on his uh, his building there in Menlo Park, <laughs> and like all of a sudden, you know, cut to the inside and him, you know, newspapers and pizza boxes <laughs> yeah. and stuff, like, disheveled hair. Oh, shit, what time is it? <laughs> oh crap! Six, ah! six months. Oh man, why did I why did I devote that first week to inventing super cocaine? That was uh, really irresponsible. <laughs> yeah, if you just pulled service, the- service, you go hold him off for like ten minutes. <laughs> service, well, get dressed first, idiot. <laughs> Yeah, he just pulls a uh, Elizabeth Holmes on the entire world would be pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Edison, we've noticed you speaking in a really weird, unnatural, deep voice for the past six months. What's that all about? I don't understand what your problem is. <laughs> uh, well, uh, they, um, I think, are just ready to... Oh, yeah, this is another thing where he describes uh, Mars in a uh, unflattering terms, even though it just kicked the crap out of us. It says... Uh, uh, though few in numbers, they represented the flower of the earth, the culmination and genius of the planet. The greatest leaders in science, both theoretical and practical, were there. It was the evolution of the earth against the evolution of Mars, a planet in the heyday of its strength matched against an aged and decrepit world. <laughs> uh, I, I, he says this like three times. A uh, reasonable belief that another world, a world so much older than the earth as Mars was? Uh yeah, I, I, and I guess maybe that's what he says, is that Mars was fleeing because its planet could no longer support it, I guess. That's why they had come here. I, that, that's the reason. So, but that's in the book. Uh, uh, well, no, it, it, he goes on to say, like, uh, Mars's population uh, w- was, was so big that it could not support it anymore. So, like, uh, the inmates of an overcrowded hive of bees, they left to find new homes. Oh. So... He's he's comparing everything to to fish and bees in this structure in this chapter. Okay, so I mean that's what I inferred from it, but it did seem like well, I mean they pulled off a pretty good, <laughs> you know, it's like the uh, you know the invasion of Pearl Harbor. You, you can't well the ships are still burning. You can't really be going. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, that was a pretty crappy invasion. Like yeah, it seemed to yeah. come off pretty yeah. well. Yeah, if you had given us a heads up, we could we would have been ready. You know, if a, if, a, if a lot of things were different, that would have gone really differently. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I guess that just has to be uh, has to be part of it. it. It does make the Martians. You know, it, it gives you a bit more understanding of, of what they were all about. Uh, this is a, a question. I don't know if you read it the same way. I guess maybe the old timey language and everything confused me. But he's treating the ships. Like they were, you know, obviously sea ships. Mm-hmm. And he's talking about the the uh, signals, the day signals and stuff. <laughs> the brilliant pennons streaming from their peaks. Uh, the, the ships themselves appear to have flag, signal flags and pennants on them. Huh. And then they, they have like lights that reflect off the sun for when they're in the black void of space. But otherwise, when they get to the surface, they have like... They have flags and stuff on them, yeah. <laughs> so they're they're going to fly to Mars with like flags flapping off the side of their. Yeah, I, it's it's I a think funny. That's how I read it. Yeah, they 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 have some sort of like um, uh, 
semaphore language and also a like light flashing Morris code, I guess, to like, um, you know, integrate things. A system of brilliant electric lights displayed at night and so controlled that by their means, long sentences and directions could be easily and quickly transmitted. So I thought it was very funny of just you know, the limits of an 1890s sci-fi imagination where you're like, well, sure, he can build an electric balloon to go to Mars, but like, you know, a, a intercom or telephone is just not something that we're prepared to to introduce into this, introduce into this theoretical world. It is funny, the places that he doesn't even see fit to hand wave it away, <laughs> which, which he does in other places. Instead, they're actually sending, you know, putting up their day signals like, on my left flank, I want, you know, he's treating them like ships in a, in a caravan. So it's, I mean, I don't know. Right. Mr. Edison had invented a helmet that when you put it on, you could hear what the guy in the other ship was saying. Like, okay, like the yeah, problem solved. I, I believe it. It would take too much for me to explain it to you how this helmet <laughs> communicated between the two. But if you picture a crow with no feathers, it goes a little of the way towards explaining it. Yeah. The downward sloping frontal brow of the crow's skull indicates that it was a being which very much enjoyed being nude of feathers. <laughs> Uh, another one of the uh, of the things that he showed the limits of his imagination is that it says because uh, this is what people one of the I think the guy who wrote in was like this book contains the first mention of spacesuits in science fiction but it's like okay but here's here's how he describes it Mr Edison had provided for this emergency um, in case they ever need to leave the ship by inventing an airtight dress constructed somewhat after the manner of a diver's suit but of much lighter material. Uh, each ship was provided with several of these suits by wearing which one could venture outside the car, even if it was by on the atmosphere of the earth. So all they did was just be like, oh, you know those suits that like divers wear? It's that, but in space. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't He doesn't work much harder. And it's pretty much like it pumps air into it uh, through a tube and they can connect and disconnect the tube and that's it. Right, yeah, it uh, is. Compressed air and all of that. You need two stout men to work the bellows, however. Uh, but the departure from Earth was arranged to occur precisely at midnight, right? Okay. And and it, was it was it Halloween in Moon? Oh, wow. oh did... man, that's what I was worried Very about because it doesn't say. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. So maybe midnight was to in case it was around Halloween. Like, mm-hmm. well, we didn't launch on Halloween, right? The thrusters were activated before that, so maybe if we were still launching then. But I don't know. I feel like the. The, the nerves of an already rattled planet would have been uh, that would have been too much for them to take. Talk about right. mass suicide. I it was it's hard to uh, keep track of. Are they currently in a state of uh, what is it like unrivaled joy and ecstasy, mm-hmm. or is everyone despondent and uh, you know taking the easy way out kind of uh, thing? It's because like, uh, everyone does the same thing all at once. Yes. Which is... Speaking also speaking of moon people, that was the one yes. where everyone was always cheering. I don't know if people are if they notice the you know the body count starting to tick up, he could go out and evaporate another wall probably. So yes, <laughs> raise more money. <laughs> Uh, they anticipate cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, I, I don't have a lot of notes in this chapter because it's a lot of that sciencey stuff. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, they take off by uh, by shooting um, hun- hundreds of thousands of fireworks heavenward. So, again, that sort of seems like a bad idea, especially if the um, you, you believe that the Martians are watching you. It says they might or might not correctly interpret its significance. But at any rate, we did not care. <laughs> So they're like playing here I am rock you like a hurricane and like, you know, <laughs> you know, doing the Hulk Hogan, like hands to the ears as they go into the rocket. And the Martians are like, we killed millions of you. Like, what are you <laughs> what are you so excited about? <laughs> and also, you know, having the big fireworks show and all of that as they as the uh, as they fly off, it's like, how how are the food shelves? Like, oh, we <laughs> emptied those to pay for the ballroom. <laughs> right. Yes. Yep, we've always been dumb and short-sighted. It is, uh, it is strong, uh, that, that type of energy. Uh, then, it then, has a gr- oh, well, you get your note first, because I, I think the ending of this chapter is one of my favorite of all time. So. Yeah, I just, I just had the, the, the line repeated verbatim, um, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is the, uh, well, I'll, I'll lead into it. I'm glad I thought of the disintegrator, he said. I shouldn't like to see that world down there laid waste again. <laughs> and here's the response. And it won't be, said Professor Sylvanius P. Thompson, gripping the handle of an electric machine. Not if we can help it. I <laughs> way to yeah, right. the danger zone. <laughs> it's a pretty good 1898 quip. 
That's great. No, I, I seriously love that. that They're speeding like... away from Earth as the fireworks are launching. It's fairly cinematic. Although the line, I am glad I thought of the disintegrator, <laughs> is fairly understated from our great wizard of Menlo Park. <laughs> like, it truly is. It's uh, setting up a room. I hadn't noticed the cubbies, or I hadn't noticed the pegboard, I think, was the uh, most boring line in that. Right. Yeah, I am glad you thought of the, the weapon that we made 3,000 of that made this whole thing possible. <laughs> Oh, if if this had been allowed to be part of fanfic, can you imagine how hard I would have oh, said no to yeah. <laughs> when someone wrote, and it won't be, said Professor Sylvanus P. Thompson, gripping the handle of an electric machine. Not if we can help it. I'd, I'd be like, who wrote that? T- take them off our uh, yeah. Patreon page and bar them. Especially once you look up who the guy is. Uh, you know, slipping his shades on as he uh, utters that cold-blooded quip is. Uh, Sylvanus P. Thompson's most enduring publication is his 1910 text, Calculus Made Easy, which teaches the <laughs> fundamentals of infinitesimal calculus. So the biggest nerd on the ship is the one uh, clap, uh, quipping like that. So yeah, the, his textbook is just like dry teaching. And then at the end of every chapter, like, are we going to learn uh, the next part of this? Not if I can help it. I'm like, <laughs> okay. Sylvanus, come on, Sylvanus. Yeah. More than one quip is probably necessary. It doesn't... <laughs> um, yeah, that's the end of chapter four, and chapter five is the final one that we uh, covered this time. Um, it starts with another just great example of the, of the wizard's genius. To prevent accidents, it had been arranged that the ships should keep a considerable distance apart. <laughs> <laughs> Edison, you've done it again! <laughs> Oh, uh, that would have been great if, like, w- while the fireworks were still going off, and We Will Rocky was playing, if like five of the ships had just smashed into another seven of the ships and yeah. just <laughs> explosions and bodies falling to the ground. <laughs> the guy's like, "Yeah, well, you you let the inventor of the X-ray drive the ship. He doesn't know how to do that. You let a I calculus said, textbook keep a guy considerable distance apart. Yeah, well, you didn't define considerable. You said thousands of millions of feet. What does that even mean?" Or if uh, Marie Curie was allowed to drive one and then she crashed it immediately. That is a coincidence. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Women drivers. Oh, Keep the fireworks going, though. We we, we spent a lot of our budget on those fireworks. We do not want to abandon them. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so he, 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 he delves into a bit more of like stuff that's like, could be the way things work, but probably aren't because it was 1898 and they didn't know a lot of stuff. He talks about how uh, when you're outside the view of the sun, when it goes behind the moon or something, that you can't see half of the ship. And like he holds up his arm, half of it seemed to be shaved off lengthwise um, because of the how the, the light spectrum works or something. It was hard to understand for a yeah, I th- brained guy like me. I think he was just talking about like when, you know, the moon is when the light is blocked off. And so it looks black with the blackness behind it. Yeah. But uh, no one thinks that the moon is shaved off. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So I guess when you see a half moon, that's sort of what he implies that, you know, that's going to be how everything looks when it's like that. Yes. Uh, But then uh, we get uh, uh, a little foreshadowing here of what's going to happen in this section with a uh, subtitle called struck by a meteor. (laughs) And then the first sentence of it is, a meteor. <laughs> that was very funny. <laughs> it's like one of those old Batman serials, you know. Yes. The time bomb blows up. And then, you know, Batman, a time bomb's about to blow up. Uh, and such indeed it was. That's a great way to follow that up. Struck by a meteor. A meteor. And such indeed it was. <laughs> All right, leave the quipping to Sylvanus P. Thompson here, service. Yeah. You're not good at it. He's the funny one. <laughs> I like this uh, this description because he's tried to provide, you know, he says like the ships are gadding about like a fish jumping out of water or whatever. Uh, this description of, of how fast the meteor was moving says, with this velocity then, it plunged like a projectile shot by some mysterious enemy in space directly through our squadron. It had come and was gone before one could utter a sentence of three words. <laughs> wow. <laughs> An odd way to put it, sir. <laughs> And then it has a uh, a description. It killed two or three men. It says, and then it, the illustration finally delivers something. It has a uh, uh, like a you know wood carving or something of this guy just being blasted by this thing, and everyone else freaking out. That's about 
a thousand times more exciting than what his actual prose of this uh, frightful tragedy in space occurring actually sounded like. Yeah, it kind of takes him a moment to get to the fact that uh, they see it go by and he's like, oh, wow, I forgot about that. Meteors, yeah. And then as an afterthought, like, oh, it had smashed through one of the cars, killing two or three guys. <laughs> and then uh, they they take another ship to this mm-hmm. in in space and they find like guys on the floor going, oh, my <laughs> gosh, their, their ship has been... Like half of their ship is gone. Right. They haven't been sucked into the void or frozen to death. They rescue them and bring them into the other ship (laughs) and basically like give them some port and some walnuts and they're fine. (laughs) Uh, Good for the Constitution. (laughs) Got a little cold for a moment there, but uh, quite bracing, I thought. (laughs) They're all British, by the way. Yeah, that's it's been a pretty standard. (laughs) 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 Yes, of course. Well, that next thing they do is, I guess they're they're taking a voyage to the moon, um, just to sort of to test all this out for everybody, or just to um, give everyone a break. I, I don't. Yeah, know. it's it's a it's a way station. He's he's very confident in his ship, which is very convenient. Like, oh, I'll, I'll take the uh, I'll grab this car if you don't mind, and you guys can get in the Kia Souls, and uh, <laughs> and then we'll drive to Chicago, and uh, we'll see if your cars are still going. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, so that's what they did, and okay. so they're gonna, they're just gonna do a little uh, spin by. Right. You know, Edison's like, "Hey, my uh, my cousin had a baby on the moon. Yeah. You guys mind if we just drop in there for a minute and it, see the baby? It's eat just a piece gonna of be sheet cake and fifteen twenty minutes. Oh, it's not gonna be fifteen no, twenty it's minutes. Not. God, it never is. God. You're gonna finish saying hello by then. And then they, you all crowd in, and then you know the. Well, 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 look who came back, Mister <laughs> College. Like, let's not get into this, Mom. Like, yeah. We oh, just dropped in. Sorry, I, did, I meant to call you the wizard. That's what they all now call you down there, huh? Oh, God, are we going to do this? <laughs> Not in front of Sylvanus, please. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, they, they are approaching the moon, and uh, Sylvanus, I mean, sorry, Service <laughs> says, notwithstanding the unexpectedly frightful and repulsive appearance that the surface of the moon presented. So suck at the moon. <laughs> yes, I wondered about that, too. It's bizarre. See, like they had uh, good telescopes, they could see the way the moon looked. Isn't it often described as calm and uh, you sure know? the sea of tranquility? Right? Isn't that the uh... <laughs> yes, well? Exactly. They they do have telescopes because he he brings us up right now. He says, "I had often on the Earth drawn a smile from my friends by showing them Cape Heracles." with a telescope and calling their attention to the fact that the outline of the peak terminating the cape was such as to present a remarkable resemblance to a human face, unmistakably a feminine countenance seen in profile and possessing no small degree of beauty. He's often drawn a smile by doing that. It's... (laughs) You know, well, it's the kind of smile where, you know, that the pain smile of, oh, mm. (laughs) Uh, doesn't that look like a fetching young maiden? Um, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have a Do you have a Henry vacuum I can look at instead to draw a <laughs> smile? <It's, laughs> I just like the uh, that, that's his that's his main party trick. And then he says, I, did, I was puzzled by this, but it's probably because I'm an idiot. He says, uh, it says the resemblance disappears. Can this indeed be Diana herself? I said aloud. But instantly afterwards, I was laughing at my fancy, for Mr. Edison had overheard me and exclaimed, Where is she? Who? Diana. Why there, I said, pointing to the moon. What, 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 what is going on? It's, is that, is <laughs> he, that what he named the woman he was always showing people to get a I smile? I guess so. <laughs> I assume he's talking about the goddess Diana. And, uh, but it is funny that like uh, afterward, I was laughing at my fancy. <laughs> And so he's laughing, and the, the two guys who they rescued from the other ship, so the one is like, blood is leaking from his throat. <laughs> uh, you appear to have burnt my lungs irreparably, dear chap. Do you think you could have a bit of gauze? <laughs> Hang on. I'm laughing at my fancy. We lost the father of modern physics. Untoward knowledge has been exhausted this day. It will take us a decade to recover from this loss. This, <laughs> But uh, it did It did look like Diana. It That's... really, it really oh, it did. <laughs> uh, so, yes, so this is the, um, I don't know, the, uh, the uh, Fellowship of the Rings entering the old statues, uh-huh. right? Like mm-hmm. there's big... Things of wonder to look at. Old ruins, yeah, moon ruins. 
moon ruins. So in case you were wondering, yes, the moon was inhabited. Uh, it was inhabited by giants, too. Yeah, big cyclopean blocks. And what is it? Is there a, is there a big statue that's a foot, or is it just a, a structure that was obviously built by people? There's a, they find a footprint. Yeah, a big footprint. So that's a, that was a, a, a key moment of Robinson Crusoe, right? He realizes he's not on the island alone by finding oh, a yeah. footprint. So <laughs> just uh, the Edison aid ripping off the uh, Robinson aid at this point in time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great book. That's like... <laughs> Great moment when all of a sudden he sees that footprint. But so they call the uh, they call the experts over, and here's the description because they find the footprint. And I guess they're just again, no hurry, you know. Mm -hmm. We're just there's it's not like there's fuel stations there. It's not like you know they're truck drivers and I'm going to grab a nap and uh, right, yeah. you get a couple honey buns and some jerky and we'll we'll be back on the road in no time. Yeah, this is a war. They are on a war mission at this point yes, in time. Yes. But they're just uh, messing around. Uh but the most minute search failed to reveal another trace of the presence of the ancient giant who had left the impress of his foot in the wet sands and the beach here so many millions of years ago that even the imagination of the geologists shrank from the task of attempting to fix the precise period. <laughs> But I, I could just see the geologists arriving at the, uh, you know, so many million years, but we can't even say point. Like, uh, would you say this was made last week? Oh, definitely not. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, how about like, was it, was it a month ago? No, oh, 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 don't be ridiculous. <laughs> millions? Sure, of course, millions, yes. How many millions? Ah, I can't say. I don't know. I can't even imagine. Does a Hitchcock rack focus Chief Brody on the beach watching Jaws yes. come in as the geologist attempts to fix the precise period? <laughs> oh, it just made me laugh. <laughs> Is that good enough to know sometime in the past? Like we, we are headed off to Mars to kill them all. Well, maybe he just means they can't actually name the thing because all you're doing is saying this many thousands of millions and no one can understand what that number is oh that's what it is it just <laughs> blew their minds i had this is a good ref, uh, example of just how boring old-timing writing was and see if you uh, remember where we've heard this uh, word before in one of our books bending over the mark in the rock nodding their heads together pointing with their awkwardly accoutred arms they looked like an assemblage of Antediluvian monsters corrected, collected around their prey. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you, you would it not be uh, mistaken if you thought that was Lair of the White Worm. Yeah. <laughs> which I think is what they call the White Worm as they were, uh, as they were doing their walnut eating. It was, it, that existed before Diluvian? <laughs> you, you've got to be kidding me. But so they essentially go along, they, so they, they split up into some um, groups. It's extremely boring uh, for, you know, uh, to, compared to like what it would be like, you know, for, it's like most of these guys are like, we're on, the, we're on the moon, this is insane. But they just sort of like look around the rocks and the ruins. But then they finally, it, I, I like this uh, description, they see something really shiny. So it says, as we rapidly approached, the dazzling splendor of the mountain became almost unbearably to, to our eyes. We were compelled to resort to the device practiced by all climbers of lofty mountains, where the glare of sunlight upon snow surfaces is liable to cause temporary blindness of protecting our eyes with neutral tinted glasses. We put on sunglasses. <laughs> there you go. Saved you a paragraph. <laughs> Uh, but they discover that these are artificial diamonds. Yes. And uh, this so is... this is supposed to be, they spend a lot of time on this. So uh -huh. this must be, you know, something that, uh, you know, people were really interested. Wow. Can you imagine if we do go to the moon? <laughs> yeah, right. And it's just all diamonds. So they're trying to figure out what they are. And he says, I cannot yet tell, replied the professor. They have the brilliancy of diamonds, but they may be something else. Moon jewels, suggested a third. <laughs> God damn it, Dan. Yeah. We all know they're moon jewels. That's what we're talking about right now. A guy just, yeah, like, you know, drinking a beer in the back, yelling that out. <laughs> moon uh, jewels. Hell, we're the first here. We can name them whatever the hell we want. They're moon jewels. <laughs> yeah. All damn right, it, well, Dan. That will be stricken from the record. <laughs> all right. Yeah. That's what you're going to land on, though, in the end. I Shotguns wish of beer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to the ship. I wish they'd given that guy a name. It would have been amazing to attribute that to a, uh, you know. 1800s scientists that we'd never heard of and that'd be the only thing we knew about him <laughs> yeah. ignore that <laughs> but yeah no so they're excited about these diamonds which they describe as prismatic rays of indescribable beauty and intensity 
you uh, hack author saying that something's indescribable. Yes. Um, but it says we had uh, solved a, another longstanding lunar problem and had perhaps opened up an inexhaustible mine of wealth, which might eventually go far toward reimbursing the Earth for the damage which it had suffered. So that was I mean, like, come on, like we're not to, we're, the big concern was this deficit spending that we've established right. here. Like, that was really what was going to get people turning their pages. How are they going to solve this problem and reimburse everybody? <laughs> no, I mean, the one person upbid themselves to thousands of millions. <laughs> Really, this is all this has done is made the uh, King of Cyan's diamond utterly worthless at this point in time. And then, what is the uh, the gross national product of of Earth? You know, with what are there a couple hundred people left <laughs> making these? <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter how many diamonds you bring back. Like I, I have, you know, half a, a piece of dried meat and a little hunk of bread that has got mold on it. <laughs> all right, I'll take it for this diamond. Right, yeah. <laughs> Or, I mean, they could have just minted the uh, trillion-dollar coin. Or, I'm sorry, the uh, the, uh, the thousand million, thousand of millions coin. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Then they find a uh, petrified skull bone. Yeah, so they do some light phrenology of their own. And don't they say there might be some... uh... Oh, yeah. Indeed, one of the professors was certain that some little concretions found on the interior of the piece of skull were petrified portions of the brain matter itself <laughs> and he set to work with a microscope to examine its organic quality so this is how they all die whatever's in there is going to uh you know latch onto them and uh, kill everybody on board in a matter of hours cool so they're all so the, the you know phrenologists are scraping away at the inside of a piece of skull <laughs> and they're all standing around like is this the best use of our time? <laughs> like, <laughs> Can we do this as we're traveling to Mars? I don't know. Like They got their hands in their pockets. They're just kind of, you know, bobbing up and down. Like, yeah, it's cold on the moon. Hey, how long do you guys think you're going to be scraping that uh, brain matter off the uh, skull portion? <laughs> it's, uh, we, 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 did, uh, we did some, uh, some tests. We have determined it is brain matter. And that is, that is all we, we can tell from that. I mean, it's... What did okay. you want from us? That's it. <laughs> okay. The, oh, whoops. The Martian fleet just uh, came racing past the moon. Wow, that looks big. That is a big fleet. Oh, that makes our millions of fireworks look like a very small amount of fireworks from how quickly they leveled the rest of the cities. Ooh, well, I'm going to get in the ship and head back to my home because I don't want to die in this horrible country with <laughs> no king has ever ruled. <laughs> But uh, yeah, put that uh, put that brain matter in a baggie or something, and we will uh, look at it once we rebuild a single science lab, which uh, you know may not ever happen. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most uh, most of Earth is uh, running around uh, wearing squirrel su- suits uh, and uh, carrying spears. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you uh, you keep that brain you matter. Hang on to that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it says the, the head of enormous size, which if it had possessed a highly organized brain of proportionate magnitude, must have given to its professor intellectual powers immensely greater than any of the descendants of Adam have ever been endowed with. So he's still going with the uh, big brain equals super smart thing. You know, he's not, uh, he hasn't really, <laughs> I guess he's never seen an elephant or something like that. Yeah, that was a, a, a uh, Sherlock Holmes thing. He often asserted that. Hmm. Like a guy would have, uh, you know, uh, a hat was left here. What do you make of it? Well, it's quite large, so he's obviously very intelligent. <laughs> he's just a fathead idiot. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's pretty impressive. Well, yeah, they, uh, they, they find these giants, and they set off with the subtitle Departing from the Moon, and that means that they are departing from their moon, carrying with us a determination to revisit it and learn more of its wonderful secrets a.k.a. harvest the moon jewels and uh, all, you know, get rich themselves in case we should survive the dangers which we were now going to face. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, it should, should be noted they left the moon with great regret. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're, you're going off to war, so I guess. Right. Yep. I guess this was supposed to be like, you know, stopping at the, you know, supposed to be seeing the dancing ladies in yeah. Vietnam or whatever Final the stage being leave. set up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's it. So, but yeah, and exciting. Sur- service also mentions at some point in time, like the first time the innocent came here, we had to notice this stuff. It's like, oh right, they they, they both have gone to the moon earlier in right. this book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Well, I feel like it uh, leaves a uh, um, 
it, it, it gives us a lot to work with here. It's very funny and it's uh, clumsy at times, um, but I, I enjoy switching it up and reading something this old every now and then, especially when it, it's science uh, fiction. Yeah, and it has it all over, um, you know, just describing sending notes to a kite, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, same, same kind of prose, but just uh, move, moving along a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you know, smashed by a comet, exclamation point, is a lot better than, uh, we reviewed the events of the day. Yes. <laughs> I don't recall that there were any events of the day. <laughs> no, the worm was seen uh, by a woman who is training a mongoose, and that's a, <laughs> let us discuss it. Well, we do have a, uh, a dissenting opinion. Why don't we read a few emails? We're going to the party. We're going to the game. We're going to the dinner. We're going to cruise out, man. All right. So a lot of uh, our listeners wrote in. Again, a lot of them are Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash 372 pages. Go check it out. This first one is from Dominic. He says, uh, I have bad news regarding Edison's conquest of Mars. This book is good. Hmm. <laughs> Just finished reading it. Easily the best book that has been featured on the so- show so far. If I could sum up one word to describe it, it would be charming. This is a charming, infectiously, infectiously optimistic bit of pulp sci-fi. It functions as almost an 1890s Star Trek, a goofy utopian view of the future where people from every country put aside their differences to deliver a patriot-sized dose of manifest destiny to Mars. I really enjoyed how service loved dropping up to date Science facts about astronomy, even the stuff that was wrong, was wrong in interesting ways. And the pace is relentless. If you are bored, just push through to the next page, and there will probably be a new location, a new Edison invention, or a new creature to see. It's ad- admirable how much weird stuff Service tried to cram into this short novel. Is it better than War of the Worlds? Tough question. What I do know is that the War of the Worlds never had a scene where someone... Okay, he goes on and gives us a spoiler, etc. But... Uh, he says, would I recommend it to sci-fi fans today? It depends. It's still dated and of its time, but they are certain, if they are reading a certain niche of sci-fi, I'd tell them to check it out. If I were to write a good review, I would give it a three out of five. It's quaint and old in a funny way, not in an awful way, like that Amanda McKittrick Ross book. I mean, I don't disagree with that. Oh, I mean. I think I enjoy, I'm enjoying reading it. Sure, but I mean, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's good. I guess charming, no, I, charming I, I, is another way to do it. That's the one that I would disagree with, that it's really good. <laughs> sure. I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that there's plenty of funny stuff, especially if you think uh, old stuff is funny. But um, yeah, it's charming, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, this ad, this email is from Adam. He says, I got my copy of the new book today. I've not started reading yet, but I wanted to share my thoughts on the book layout, and it's very odd. The most unusual thing for me is the choice of paper. They've used that weird translucent type paper you sometimes see in low-quality Bibles or used as toilet paper in schools. It feels smooth to touch and makes a horrible (laughs) scratching sound when you turn the page. I don't know if others had the same copy, but it was the only one I could source in the UK. Uh, Adam, you might have gotten a copy of the Netronomicon or something like that. uh, I'm not sure if you should be reading this book. Human skin. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's a a green mist being emitted from it when I, I saw it on my nightstand in the morning. I I the I was thinking it was the layout of our uh, the hippie book, um, mm-hmm. but uh, that one's just uh, badly formatted. I don't I don't yes. recall that the paper is uh, of note. No, anyway. the paper is uh, standard uh, Create Space uh, printing paper. Sure, but Adam, if you're over there, I mean, and want to uh, pay a visit to the Free River community, we would not mind uh, <laughs> some investigative work. I think <laughs> uh, this is from Edmund said, while there's no shortage of done moments, I found this reading assignment to be very dry in the wake of the cozy verse. I'm not going to lie. At a certain point, I started to zone out and come up with anagrams for the name of our author, which proved to be more entertaining. I look forward to getting into the bulk of the story now that the illustrious Mr. Service has set the table, but the setting of the table has proven to be a strain on my patience. My big takeaway here is that Thomas Edison invented the first killing ray with delivery means, and then he liked to use (laughs) it for, for acts of animal cruelty. Um, he says uh, it was a crow, so perhaps this will endear him to Mike. We we definitely talked about that on here, right? We, yes, yes I, I, we, did. we We didn't when we did that, but uh, uh, he says, I don't under care how famous Edison is. There is no way he should be allowed to attend a summit of all of the major world leaders with a disintegrating weapon on his person. President McKinley really should have tightened security. Come to think of it, he probably should have been benefited from tightening his security in general. And then he has given us his anagrams for Garrett Putnam's service. Would you like to hear some? Yes, I, I think I sent you some after our last. It was off air, but 
I, was, uh, I, I had the machine going as well, <laughs> but I didn't use his full name, so I'm interested in this. Well, he sort of he sort of cheats here. He makes them into other uh, things that have a uh, initials as the first part of the name. So, T M Nutgrass is a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. G P V starts urine stream. <laughs> T V arse garment purists. <laughs> G S strumpet narratives. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> RPV streaming utter ass. And uh, <laughs> All right. he says, this one is, uh, is this uh, related to Maxim? Speaking of the mister, Mrs. NS Reg taught privates. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know if he went to the, uh, the, the dirty anagram generator. Yeah. Right? Whew. Wow. Spicy meatballs. Maybe if you just scroll to the bottom, you get those. I don't know. <laughs> um, Oh, oh yeah, and the other one was from uh, Emma asking for a sonic challenge of the uh, the cry that went up about uh, Athenians and Circe's, which I believe we did. So yeah, wow, nice. Just three emails. Uh, let's uh, let's twice by John and Justin. It says this is our contribution. He said in broken English, and they both pointed out that that sentence was obviously not in broken English. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly grammatically correct. Uh, we had uh, Augusta. The telegraph lines and the ocean cables labored with the messages that in endless succession and burdened with an infinity of detail were sent all over the earth. And he says the telegraph cables are working harder than our author, who so far has described almost nothing in detail and saying indescribable does not count. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mike submitted a danger that might easily have been anticipated that perhaps had been anticipated, but against which it had been difficult, if not impossible, to provide presently manifested itself he said you're the author you're the narrator it was either anticipated or it wasn't it was possible or it wasn't <laughs> wow i missed that one that yeah, one's me good too. Yeah. uh heather and blake both submitted the equally warm with the greetings extended to the representatives of mexico and the south american states the end the rest was pointed out there as well jay submitted the flying machine had been seen by many persons hovering by night high above the orange hills and then 48 more words <laughs> he said so many persons were hovering by night high above the hills the misplaced modifier could have been uh, cleared up by adding a comma between many persons and hovering but sadly the edison's conquest of mars manuscript had already exhausted the boston post typesetter's supply of comma blocks <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we got uh, Jeffrey, well, submitted the, it would carry me into technical details that would hardly interest the reader to describe the mechanism of Mr. Edison's flying machine. Uh, Lindsay, oh yeah. <laughs> Lindsay submitted already. Architects were busily at work planning new 20-story hotels and apartment houses, new churches and new cathedrals on a grander scale than before. And he's like, ah, you know, that luxury apartments and hotels and cathedrals before the hospitals and shelters. Right. <laughs> um Let's see. Jackson submitted, With marvelous speed, we rushed westward, rushing high to skim over the snow-top peaks of the Rocky Mountains, and then the glittering whim of the Pacific was before us. And he just pointed out that he has confused the Rockies for the Sierra Nevadas, if that is actually the next thing that appeared uh, through their windows. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Uh, Curtis submitted, The President of the United States, of course, presided. And he said, The Prime Minister of Canada, of course, ministered. (laughs) Uh, I never really thought of presided being tied to president, but I guess that's uh, actually where that comes from. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Uh, Emily submitted wonderful stories quickly found their way into the newspapers concerning what Mr. Edison had already accomplished with the aid of this model electrical balloon. And she pointed out, yes, why not even the term flying machine, which is the uh, Martian vehicle that Edison studied to create the said balloon in the first place. <laughs> Uh, and Harrison said it would carry me into technical details. It would hardly interest the reader to describe the mechanism of Mr. Edison's flying machine. Um, <laughs> Jenny submitted the force of the explosion may be imagined when it is recollected that they had to give the car a velocity of more than seven miles per second. She wants a, a passive voice drinking game for this book. Yeah, that's what I. <laughs> that was my first. Oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> Mandy submitted probably they are not dancing on Mars but are getting ready to make us dance. That was, um, that was not Sylvanus P. Thompson. Yeah, that that's... pointed out, she said, was the world's greatest genius. <laughs> Tom, Thompson aid? Yeah, R- yeah, maybe. Yeah, write some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling he might be showing up in later, uh, in later fanfics. Yes. George submitted, Mr. Edison had made provision by means of an abundance of glass-protected openings to permit the inmates of the electrical ships to survey their surroundings without quitting their interior. 
And he said, Windows, the word you're looking for is Windows. <laughs> uh, brother, what else do we have? Uh, oh, Janelle just submitted Moon Jewels, suggested a third. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, uh, Michael submitted, In this matter, he caused an ink stand to disappear under the very nose of the Emperor William without a spot of ink being scattered upon his sacred person. But evidently, the odor of dis- disunited atoms was not agreeable to the nostrils of the Kaiser. And he said, that's what I'd be worried about when someone points a disintegration re at me, that the results might smell funny. <laughs> Did you have any others that we haven't discussed? Um, well, no, we discussed it. Okay. It's, um, one of my favorites was, and I won't read it, was the uh, uh, the Chinese guy talking about the music. <laughs> so I'll let people say it because I'm not going okay. to say that it. That sounds, yeah. <laughs> that's just his, uh, his, his uh, transcribed Racism. Yes, because okay. transcribed. <laughs> uh, I had one that I did not um, involve, just because it's a it's a great uh, run on sentence on the model of the celebrated corps of literary and scientific men which Napoleon carried with him in his invasion of Egypt. Mister Edison selected a company of the foremost astronomers, archaeologists, anthropologists, botanists, bacteriologists. This is all in alphabetical order. Chemists, physicists, mathematicians, mechanicians, meteorologists, and experts in mining, metallurgy, and every other branch of practical science, as well as artists and photographers. <laughs> <laughs> Just lump them all in there. There you go. We got everyone on board. And a variety of 80s dance moves. Right. Mm. Oh, well, so uh, not uh, not everyone's agreeing with uh, with our writer that this is a good book. Uh, I mean, it doesn't sound like that. Again, I, I, I read that email because that was the only one we got going to bat, but I'm sure everyone's having fun with it. Yeah, no, I think so too. But, uh, you know, taking on his uh, taking on his prose and stuff, I think that's all fair. Yeah, fair game. I definitely think so. Run-ons, yeah. passive voice, uh, weird ticks of saying you're not going to describe something and then describing it. It's a, yeah. They were publishing it serially and probably trying to get it all out there before they got hit with a copyright uh, infringement lawsuit. So maybe that's why the editor was not uh, super involved. That's right. All right. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to go on. Me too. I can't wait to meet the Martians and measure their heads. All right. So long. Thanks, everybody.